Inshallah. Are we are we going? I'll 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 let you know. So I shouldn't sing I shouldn't sing some nasheed in the meantime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right into the microphone. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to another episode of Boys in the Cave. My name is Tanzan and I'm joined by my co-host Raphael. And alhamdulillah, we're joined by a special guest, Ahmed Karat, who has joined us in the cave in the past before. So for those who don't know about Ahmed, he's an IT consultant by profession and is the president of Maidan Archery Club, having done archery for 14 years. And we wanted him back on because... We just had such a great reception about the episode we did with him. I think a lot of people, they don't expect those sort of episodes from people that aren't um, known globally. They already expect that, okay, if you have this kind of knowledge base, you're already somewhat known worldwide. But then we had such good reception, alhamdulillah. I had messages, people telling me, you know, um, it was one of the best episodes and they really vibed with it. I just feel like the topic of conversation about archery and spirituality is just almost unheard of. So that's why we wanted you again. We wanted to get more juice out of you because last episode was like one hour. So alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair for joining us back in the cave. So assalamu alaikum, Ahmed, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's good to be here again. Alhamdulillah. And we didn't really ask you this in the last podcast, but I actually wanted to get an idea of your background in general, like how you grew up. We did kind of touch on it. You said that from memory, your um, your father was like a butcher or a hunter <laughs> and that that's <laughs> where you got your love of meat from because we were talking about veganism. But I wanted to get more juice out of you because it seems like you had an hist- uh, interesting background and an interesting upbringing. So yeah, wh- where did you grow up? What was your upbringing like? And how did you become what you are today? Alhamdulillah. Um to clarify that point about my father, he was a butcher and that did not contribute to my hunting because it was actually, um, it wasn't the most pleasant experience to see animals being slaughtered um, often. It was my uncle who introduced me to hunting and m- the more gentle side. Um, my father never wanted to m- me to, be- to become a butcher. He did not enjoy taking animals' lives at, on, on a massive scale. Um, he started his career as a butcher in an abattoir and left soon after. So was it, was it something enjoyable? No, not from my father's perspective. But when I saw the way that my uncle harvested animals, it gave me a certain level of appreciation for nature. The way that hunters... So to speak, we, we don't refer to hunters killing animals. We, we refer to hunters um, harvesting the animal. And uh, he was the one who really showed me the gentler, the, the more gentle side of and, and the side of being one with, the, with nature. So later in my life, when I needed to purchase the game and be more efficient at skinning and you know purchasing the meat, that's where my father came in. Um, so my family originally migrated from Andalusia uh, into the Ottoman Empire in a place called Kraina. Kraina is a place where the Ottoman, it was like the uh, frontier of the Ottoman Empire into Europe. And um, when they migrated alongside, um, it was a a lot of people migrating, Uh, they came with their horses because they were all horsemen. And that's where the name Karat comes from. It originally was Karaat. And that was, you know, kind of, kara means black and at means horse. We generally were dark-haired, dark-skinned people. And um, at, so kara is black in Turkish and at is horse. And they settled in a place called Verbanya, close to Banja Luka in Bosnia. They uh, they bred horses and they were, they were stock farmers. And as the demand for horse lessened, they switched to, cattle because you know dealing with with meat and you know um in the meat industry was profitable business and they eventually became butchers you know the family started you know dealing with in livestock and and um that that's that's how they all became butchers but yeah to touch on that point it was really my uncle who and a lot of the people's uh, people of that area it was common that every house had a uh, hunting hound 
and most people would go out hunting. It was a very common thing to do. Um, my father did not do such things. He was he was not he did not enjoy taking life more than he had to for for his work. But it was my uncle who you know he was a carpenter and he really hunting was his thing where he would go and connect and feel one um, in the woods and you know the way that he harvest, harvested animal he was a gentle gentleman by nature but he would only take what he needed it's yes no i was just gonna say that subhanallah that's that's very interesting in it, and especially in terms of how it contributed to you know the skills that you have today and the skills that you teach today but I'm very interested. So you grew up in, in obviously in, in Bosnia. Bosnia is the correct way to say Bosnia it? is correct. Bosnia Herzegovina. But yeah. we re- often it's a political statement when you say you are Bosniak. Bosniak, so yeah. They're the Muslims. Uh, yeah. So yeah. The, if you want to identify your national nationality and religion, you say I'm Bosniak. Um, but if you are if you are true to to the sense of the word of Bosnia, you would say I'm a Bosnian Muslim. Yeah. Or I'm a Bosnian Serb. Because there are a lot or of Croats. not Croissant. Bosnian Serb, but you would say Bosnian Catholic or Bosni- Bosnian Orthodox. Because people in that region identify straight away nationality with religion. And they're trying to mix it. So the Serbs are trying to pull an agenda by saying, I'm a Serb and therefore I cannot be anything but Orthodox. Or the Croatians say, I'm a Croat, therefore I cannot be anything else but a Catholic. Uh, we Bosnians are more liberal or not, I wouldn't say liberal, we're more cosmopolitan. We're accepting of others in our in our nation or we're trying to be. Um, so when you are a Bosnian, you can be a, a any religion you want um, as long as you identify as Bosnian. And that's one key fundamental difference between mm. Bosnia, Serbia and Croatia in that region. It would have been a lot more confusing and 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 very challenging for the for the bosnian muslims particularly mm. or maybe not even particularly because you would have grown up in the time of uh, the yugoslavian Republic. yeah i was a pioneer with tito i had to sl- swear allegiance as a kid to tito and and the you know communist party and all that they <laughs> they oh yeah, it was indoct- <laughs> indoctrination did it, did, um, yeah but how, how did that sort of influence you know your your community and the, and the Bosnia community growing up that kind of hard line government sort of atheism being impressed upon the people because it's still a very religious place in in many respects Yugoslavia I don't know if I touched on this on last episode about the conquest of Bosnia I think I did I don't remember who can so give a rundown initially Sultan Muhammad Fatih or Mehmed Fatih mm-hmm. as we call him when he conquered Bosnia, he made his tikhara. In the past, the Janissary army especially, the Janissary unit was the first unit that had specialization in it. So the unit had people who were arms masters, people who could fix weapons, people who were vets, people who were medics. So they were all skilled in warfare, but each one of them would have a speciality. And in each unit, they had a, what in today's museum referred to, they would carry special helmets, Sufi sheikhs of that unit. So not all Sufi uh, orders were peaceful, so to speak. They were not all like hippie-looking guys who, who would never like conflict. Some of their orders, like Bektashi or some hardcore Sufi orders, were uh, war war. Uh, inclined so th- certain rituals that they had were militaristic Janissary orders were famous for that and each order each unit had their own sheikh so the army would have a sheikh in it fighting along other troops that was their specialty when Sultan when Sultan Muhammad Fatih prayed istikhara he saw a dream in that dream he saw he, what was this istikhara about? It was about whether the Muslims will stay in Bosna or the Balkans or they would perish. So basically they conquered this, this land and he was asking Allah, what do I do now? So the army was told, don't settle, don't stay and don't, we, we won't settle, we won't go. They were in limbo for three days. In this istikhara, he saw fire. Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali, 
Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And then we, when he woke up, he would go to the people who were able to give tafsir, the meanings of dreams. And they told him, the fire means Iman. That's, that's the meaning of it. So that means Iman will stay, Muslims. Believers will continue to flourish in this place. Sayyidina Ali means knowledge. There will be people who are knowledgeable in this place. Sayyidina Uthman means, we say marhamat. It means like, if you slap me, I won't slap you back. It's like lutf, the mm. kindness, people who are forgiving. That, that was the key thing to Uthman. And they saw Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who was representing generosity. And they, they, pe people will have karam, people will be generous. But you didn't see Sayyidina Omar. It means that this place won't have much justice. That sums up the situation in Bosnia. Adding on to that, when I was speaking to a prominent Muslim scholar who passed away, Rahimahullah Haji Mulic, he opened up about Bosnia after communism took place. He said Bosnia took four major hits, so to speak, during this time, and it resulted to where we are today. So we got, the first hit was the intellect. So what the communists did, um, they rounded up and ex often executed or imprisoned ulema. So they fir the, the first hit to Islamic institution in Bosnia was ulema. They started to basically kill them off. Second hit was the taking of waqf. So 70% of downtown Sarajevo was waqf. At the time when the communists came in, 70% of it was waqf. And that waqf was established in a way, it wasn't in a centralized unit, it was established to support Masajid, to support the you know itself. So they took that. The third hit was um, closing down of Maitif. We say Maitif is the school for seven around seven year olds where they learn the obligations of the religion so everybody goes through that school in bosnia it means it they teach you the basics how to believe in allah and his prophets how to pray how to fast you know all these basics they stop that and you can see the generation that missed out on Maitif in bosnia and the ones who had it a massive difference and the last hit was the hit on the young Muslim, um, young Muslims uh, referred to as young Muslims by the my great my grandfather was part of. He served two years in jail. That was the last hit, where people were trying to save the religion and revive it, but that was the kind of opposing force. So that gives you an idea of what Islam went up against during the time of communism in Yugoslavia, and. These were the four main events. The the killing of the ulama, the uh, taking of wakuf, the shutting down of the educational institutions, and um, last, the the stopping of the the young Muslims. It was a uh, young Muslims was like a brotherhood sort of um, establishment that they were trying to revive. And they had to go underground. And the moment that they found out about them, they came down really with, a, with an iron fist. So Tito was, was a genius in terms of strategist and tactician. He was, he, was, um, he was amazing at his job. But that meant that the common folk really suffered. Whoever stood up against him really, really didn't, ha didn't have a chance. And uh, obviously things... <clears throat> didn't necessarily get much better for Bosnia in the immediate aftermath of the Yugoslavian Republic as well. Everyone, everyone, uh, including my family, who obviously are not Muslims, mm. they're well aware of what happened in the early 1990s. And, you know, to this day, they, they still tell me how when they meet Bosnian people, and even though they, they, they understand that Bosnian people are, are lovely people, they do feel us and they're, and they're happy people, a lot of them and very welcoming because we, we actually know a few and um, I think 
th- there's always that sense of sadness and that sense of pity for over, over what happened and and just the horror of uh, 1992 is it 1992 onwards. 92 to 6 it's ironic because yeah we we do feel sorry for ourselves and we do feel that yes we were the uh, in a way the first and and in a way we were in Europe right but let's not allow that to take from the fact that Bosnia and what happened there was an experiment because the model that they used the the forces that made Bosnia occur and that were behind what happened in Bosnia um were you know the ones to blame are not the only ones who were you know holding the knife it's the ones who are behind the ones who are holding the knife and bosnia and what happened in bosnia was an experiment that is today and after it occurred on and on in places such as to relevant examples are syria libya and the likes except on a much bigger scale correct so we feel sorry for what happened in bosnia but we allowed bosnia to desensitize ourselves because i remember the protests when we have what happened in bosnia it, it, there was outrage in the world we were in, in in the heart of europe and we allowed this to happen a, a genocide after two, world war 2 we allowed this to happen um but let's say if you move this conflict outside of Europe into Africa or you or no one cares Asia or anywhere NATO, else NATO NATO bombed nobody cares uh Sar- not but Sarajevo but they used to bomb Belgrade. the Serbian positions yeah that was after afterwards but that was when Albania got involved yeah. that's why I said Albanians are a different type of people yeah, yeah. they're a lot more organized and they're a lot more better connected uh, and that's a different story so let's not say NATO did not contribute to Bosnian peace or to Bosnian uh, benefit, hardly at all. They did contribute to Kosovo and and Albania. Pristina, yeah. Those were two separate events. So people mistake. They say, oh, NATO bombed Belgrade because of Bosnia. No, they bombed Belgrade because Albanians had a very high connection in Washington. Yeah. That was the only reason, politics. Yeah, that makes sense. But the point I was going to make is more so the fact that uh you would never see that kind of involvement anywhere outside the european continent well anyway. i don't know if it's because we are white or i don't know if it's because we're in europe but what i believe strongly is that it was a kind of a experiment to see how much people can take seeing others die and mass so today my, my i believe many worse things are happening than what happened to us in bosnia it's it saddens me to say this because of the pain that we suffered but also now that we've suffered it so many are going through worse i don't want to like let's say if you name i don't know syria is a great example but also things that are undercover like china yeah you know the con- my father survivor of concentration camp he told me you know the things that that happened over there is atrocious it's it's not human and that's what you know people are unfortunately a lot of people are easily manipulated and do things that are horrible mm. and it's not in their na- you know it is kind of in their nature in a way violence is does is the easiest form of expression to humans quite often but you know th- those people who who yield the weapon aren't really the ones behind the weapon it is an, an engineered orchestr- orchestrated way to you know to to start events and then make a cataclysm to happen and then you know you you can't have mass killings uh, and and blame just the people who were doing the killing of course not and yeah. i i think it's really interesting though i mean i grew up during the time of the iraq war mm. and it was only until two years it was only two years ago when a politician in a Scottish politician named George Galloway mm. mentioned the fact that um, something like a quarter of a million children died in Iraq directly or, or, or indirectly as a result of the American um, invasion of Iraq. And I grew up and I would never, ever have had an idea 
of how many innocent people were killed because of the American invasion of Iraq. Mm. And I, th- I think that that just really hits home the point that you just made. The fact that there are so there's this kind of uh, selective memory and this selective conscience. And and I yeah I I even grew up thinking that you know the Iraqis and the and the, I mean my parents are kind of very sort of liberal and and left wing so I kind of understood from a very young age the issues with the American administration but from the media I got this impression of you know Iraq is a dangerous foreign place that attacked America and America because that's that's the media narrative that we were fed you know if not necessarily overtly all the time at least sort of covertly. And yeah, you subscribe to that. And it's it's shocking how I I lived two decades of my life, right? It was a conscious person or maybe not quite two decades, but uh and didn't and wasn't aware of the horrors and and the death and the destruction um that took place only because we as this country were partisan to it. Um in many ways. I mean, Australia were involved in that in that coalition and Yeah, it, it was, but also <sighs> I will connect this back to cuz Tito sold weapons he was it was ingenious like I said Tito sold weapons to Libya he sold weapons to Iraq 80% of the commu- uh, was well, 75% of the economy was based on weapon sales mm. in ex Yugoslavia they would take they were good with the Soviets and they were good with the uh Middle East and they were feared by the West yeah. so they kind of walked a really fine line and it, it was huge benefit to Yugoslavia. Although the Soviets wanted Tito gone, didn't they? They tried to assassinate him. They tried him. to get rid of him several times, but they couldn't. So they ended <laughs> up, you know, if you if you can't beat them, you he's better close than far. Do mm. you know what I mean? So you he's they kept him at bay by bribe well, not bribe, but you know, giving him things that he wanted, which kept him communist. And that kind of kept the West in check because that's a very strategic route there to Turkey. And then yeah, to the course. Middle East. That that area has always been important. The Orient Express yeah, used to pass through there, the old <laughs> Orient Express. So going back to Iraq. So Tito sold weapons. I think, yeah, yeah, massively. He sold weapons to the Middle East. So they were using uh, Yugoslav-made tanks and all sorts of stuff. Oh, wow. Um, but I was I was getting back to the point of, yes, the reason why we weren't so aware it was because we had only one channel of media or one channel of knowing but i think today with the multiple channels of knowing and then what you guys are doing and what many many others like you are doing is you you're establishing a type of awareness initiative that you know tells people hey there's this side to you know there's a different side to the story and there's all these statistics that support what we say and uh, i think that's do you think the digital age and the, uh, we're definitely. talking about the information age before yeah. do you think that that's having a positive impact on the kind of awareness of the every man or do you think it's not i think it's two twofold i think the digital age and we were talking about in the previous time of ottoman empire the biggest commodity was people, humans yeah. people okay so they treat, treated lightly when it came to killing if you were a mamluk you your test for uh, for the swordsmanship if you're able swordsman or not you know in the beginning they would give you a sword and you would cut lead right and then after cutting lead your hand would become strong they would give you a sharp sword to practice they would practice and practice and practice and then your exam was you open a book and they tell you cut me 25 pages or cut me 3 pages or cut me 50 pages the reason for that is to have a feeling in the blade because often they would not they would be told do not kill so they would have to just wound somebody enough to capture them so they don't kill them mm-hmm. because humans were the most pre- precious thing at at that time today in the digital age information is the most precious thing and you turn that around because of that humans were not as valued are not as valued today yeah i didn't think and about that and that's why things happen on an industrial scale like death in for example raka where is it what was it um, fallujah or somewhere else i heard someone say um again one of those prominent politicians were saying women are not allowed to have children they were just told by doctors don't have children because of the excessive radiation that the plutonium 
shells head. Mm. We have this in Bosnia. Plutonium is a terrible thing to use in war, and it shouldn't be used because it has radioactive effects, and people start coming out deformed, right? I, in this place in Iraq, um, they were told, like, just please don't have kids because they were coming out non-human almost um, because of the re- radiation. So digital age, yes, it's twofold because di- digital age, age is a result of this and mass killing, which is allowing us kind of to have a wake-up call through this, hopefully, mm-hmm. so that people realize, look, the way to go isn't just through consumerism, being greedy and killing others for our profit. It's There's more to it. Yeah, of course. So it's. I think it's twofold. Linking that kind of the, the, to the Sharia, I think um, the second thing that the Sharia aims to preserve is life uh, after Deen. And it's interesting. And, and that can also be extended... I mean, not in, in necessarily in terms of the same importance, but one of the major kind of discussions nowadays is about the slaughter of animals as well and the rate at which and the way in which animals are being killed yeah. for, for profit. And it's almost like these things which our spirituality and our, our religion and our deen teach us about the value of human life and the value of nature are kind life, of lost, yeah. lost in this modern age, aren't they, in many ways? And that's kind of where you come in, you know, you're very ah. much in tune with those sorts of things. So how do you perceive of the, we talked a bit about the human life, but how do you perceive of the kind of abuse of nature in the modern world? I could, as in all things in our religion, we start with ourselves, yeah? So not because of egotism, but I think it's important to start with ourselves and then work out. I suffer from something called ITP. It's called idiopathic thrombocytopenia. It means that your platelet count is so low, you start to bleed to death internally. It means your platelets don't produce. And that's what drove me mostly to hunting and living more org- organic. ITP is a new, uh, it's not a phenomenon, it's, new, it's a new condition. And my brother-in-law, who is a clinical research manager for hematology, uh, he was at Concord, now he moved to Western Sydney. He mentioned to me that there is a strong research coming out because it's a recent condition that people are beginning to have more and more. He said all research concludes so far that it is connected with processed food. Everything is connected with this en masse taking production of food, especially meat. Because the meat is produced using steroids, hormones, and often uh, direct or indirect um, genetical um, um, tampering. So when I say direct, meaning human, in, you know, goes in and changes the DNA change, uh, or through breeding, which causes the um, imp- too much purity in the in the meat, so to speak. Uh, genetical purity which gives us a product that's not suitable for us originally meat is not supposed to be consumed a lot we all know this we're as muslims first of all and i was talking to a non non non-muslim lady she's like oh yeah you you muslims don't you know you guys knew all these things that we're coming up with a long time ago and she just said it like that you know (laughs) she was like i went "Mm, interesting i never thought of it that way because She's an outsider looking in. So what do I think? I, 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 I don't really have a thought. I experienced it on my own, so to speak, skin. And ITP is a result, I strongly believe, of processed um, food, especially meat. Um, so when I eat wild game, I can't eat as much of it as I can eat of, I don't know, an, a succulent lamb cutlet. I can eat a kilo of lamb mm. and I can only eat 300 grams of venison because the the meat is the meat is very different tasting and it's a lot more rich in protein and, and nutrients while lamb is filled with more fat and yeah, and course. we all know that the scholars said the fat of the lamb uh, or the meat of the lamb is better than its fat and the fat of the beef is better than its meat so mm. you know fat isn't always a bad thing but lamb is probably um, a great example of not, you know, wanting to stay away from fattiness. 
Yeah, of course. And then beef, again, you're meant to have more fat. But yeah, um, that's kind of what I experienced having suffered from ITP. You know, that it, it's, I'm a perfect example of, of a byproduct of, you know, and mass slaughter and mass killing and a mass production of, um, in the food industry. Yeah, I wanted to like share even my personal uh, experiences. Like, I'm relatively a skinny di- guy. Like, yeah, maybe I have a bit of fat in my body. I feel, I'm sitting here feeling deeply ashamed, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but like with me, right? Because um, you know, eating out a lot. Even me, like, I have this com- um, issue um, in my body where if I drink water now, I have to go to the bathroom in like 10 to 15 minutes because of the processed food that I've been eating. So then the doctors have been saying that I have to like eat heaps of vegetables and um, fruits to make up for that issue in my body. And it's to do with like processed meat and stuff, even though I'm not blown out fat, but it's actually affected my body, even though I'm a skinny guy, relatively skinny, right? So it's crazy how even to that degree, it's affecting people. You don't necessarily, you can be a healthy guy, but yeah. you're still there's something wrong with your body i don't think i eat any more than my italian ancestors ate in terms of calories consumed per day Mm. it's the way that food is prepared now and what is in foods that is leading to the kind of epidemic of of weight gain and and obesity in many ways yeah oils yeah oils are key so the oil that we use for cooking today are very bad so for example corn oil Mm. The way that they get the most out of corn in terms of oil is they basically burn the cor- corn in a airtight chamber and they add it's a form of alcohol but it's like a kerosene not like I forgot the te- technical term mm. but you might want to research into it it's fascinating the way that corn oil is made is um is so bad and because of those because of that process of making that oil and maximizing that oil to get the most money um we get a lot of byproducts or a lot of side effects from that oil because of the process i can imagine yeah Yeah. in the past honey there's no way that we can have this much honey on the shelves (laughs) uh, that bees can produce hey bees are dying so there's a less and less honey, and um, two, it's it's all cornstarch. It's not really honey, because I know this because the remedy to my ITP was h- pure honey um, mixed with um, uh, black seed, uh, black black seeds. As habat sauda, they call it in Arabic. It's a prophetic ointment or or medication but the moment i put fake honey or honey of the shelf into that my body would uh, would reject the medicine and i would have to vomit oh, so I, my body only accepted the pure honey pure honey so it was a way for me to you know if it, somebody wanted to test honey they would give me fake honey to, <laughs> to try with the to medicine I would thing, po- yeah. and you I'd would puke it out <laughs> and you would know <laughs> if it stays down it's real honey if, yeah if it comes up then you know what it is um but yeah, about food and about killing, any human being that sees killing and mass is not going to pe- feel all right, even if it's halal. Uh, there's, you can't tell me that your heart is in place and that you're okay with just seeing hundreds of animals die at one and one hit on a factory on belt. a factory way. Even if it's halal, it's it's hard. You know, it's any human decent human being. It's hard. But if you see a guy, there's a, there's a guy on YouTube, he did it. And also my, the way my grandfather and the way that the farm people um, slaughter animals, especially Muslims. You know what? Like you feel relaxed because the animal is relaxed. You, we all know in Sharia what we have to do in terms of feeding the animal beforehand, making it drink, making sure that it's at ease and calm so that you haven't chased it. Right, there's a spiritual, there is a benefit where there's le- lack of hormones in the muscles because the animal didn't ru- run. There's there's physical benefit, yeah? The other be- spiritual be- benefit is also the animals are calm and you feel calm when that life is taken, f- essentially for your benefit, for your survival. Um, but it's always the one animal, the one cow that feel- feeds the many homes or the one lamb that feeds several families. 
it's never um it's 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 never in mass on a on a big scale how would you say um in this day and age where people are really seeking to ha- eat meat but then um because of global population like how else would you be able to manage to kill animals without doing it in such a manner like in um high production factories and all that sort of like <laughs> you're asking him to solve pos- yeah, the biggest like, <laughs> issue in the world the like world. How, maybe you do have some thoughts on this you know it's it's the issue isn't in production see the people are trying to use the an excuse to feel better about consuming the issue is consuming consumerism itself and our hunger we became so hungry that um we consume too much and i think the issue isn't in the ability to produce but in our ability or in our inability to cut our plate to you know get smaller portions because waste if you turn that around and say we throw about 70 is it 70% of our food that we buy in the west so we throw out a good 60 70% of what we eat um so we will stack up our plate but we won't finish it that's a perfect if or for example veggies the same people who are who are arguing that argument saying so how do we produce all this food um are throwing out bad carrots if a carrot has in a certain shape or a certain way it looks they'll throw that food away and won't give it to anyone their dumpsters filled with veg- veggies and and also meat um that other people and other people are going hungry so the issue isn't in our ability to produce it's it's like saying you know i'm going to i'm going to save time by stopping the clock that's the sort of argument that they're having it's really irrelevant and 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 you know unintelligent way to argue things you should look at internally and say okay there's a problem with our consumerism and there's a problem with the amount of food that we consume and we don't share with the rest of the world so the 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 question itself that they ask is twofold and, and not logical so the whole world needs to um follow islam and <laughs> the problem <laughs> follow the sunnah of the prophet so yeah. like yeah, even he's not the only prophet yeah all prophets came with the same message prophet jesus isa alayhi salam he never ate meat and he always would eat raw fruit like raw uh, raw veggies he was on a raw diet i don't know today there's a there's a new diet that's similar to his where they only eat paleo paleo that's yeah. the one um so people are coming up with all these new and hip things that are actually same things that the prophets all the prophets came with and they advised us and they somehow connect with it's crazy how people love to blindly follow science and obviously science is good you know it helps us to improve our technology and stuff but from my experience just growing up I've seen all these like fads, you know, from science saying follow this and that and you have to have this much and there's a food pyramid or whatever. But then the sunnah doesn't necessarily say that to that T, but then you start realizing on an experiential level when you follow the sunnah, you can see the benefits already, but then sometimes like like for example, even the idea of eating little, it would be confusing to a lot of scientists like, "Oh no, you have to have this portion, that portion, that portion." But when you realize when you're not eating, my mind is like super sharp, so then you start seeing those kind of wisdoms coming out from, you know, the sunnah and the hadiths yeah. and the Quran, like these things that I guess science can't really get to the bottom of. It's all I don't know there's this kind of other dimension that kind of missing out on I think you kind of have to have knowledge of so I'm not just saying this cuz I'm fat by the way but I think you do <laughs> have to I think you do have to have knowledge of so I don't think that that any two people are exactly the same in what they can eat and what they can't eat and how much of certain foods they need I think it's an objective reality that um different people um need different food different amounts of food and different types of food some people might be iron deficient naturally and need of to course, eat more yeah, iron. there's obviously But, um so it's like yeah. knowledge of self right you need to know yeah. yourself and you need to know your limits and you need to know it's like you know everyone has a car right you need to know what petrol runs best in your car yeah obviously you can't fill more than the the, the tank otherwise you know the car's going to just leak or whatever um that was like my angles more so like for example i know uh, when i was reading stories about the olia they would 
literally eat like one or two pieces of bread. Even day. today. It would be it like you know, it'd be unfathomable for like how is it healthy and this but they're the most glowing people, they probably sleep like three, four hours and their face is like radiating like they're, they're, light. There are all of them today who just drink a couple of sips of milk a day and and maybe some bread and the only time they'll ever eat more than that is if they're invited to eat by by it's funny else. like you bring the um milk up i had um there was this brother on a um thick thread that i'm on on whatsapp he said that he was like one of the last few people to study with marble to hajj before he passed away mm-hmm. and so he said that um he'd be giving i think a few glasses of milk a day and then there was a point in time where he was just so thirsty like he was just like days that he had to like kind of beg on the street for water but then it kind of puts into perspective that means that you know marble to hajj for example would be living on that kind of diet in the middle of the desert desert. (laughs) so people who are scientists like coming up and doing like they'll be bamboozled they'll be like you know it's an anomaly yeah and i I think that the sunnah like the the, sunnah what i'm saying is that you're following the sunnah you'll start seeing these sort of realities and and, i mean we that doesn't make sense for for, even if you think about it relatively yeah how many non-Muslims have ever come up to you in your life and been like, you can't even drink water <laughs> like like during the month of Ramadan? And they just can't fathom the fact, like even my parents, they can't fathom the fact that I would go from 5 or, or you know, 4.30 in the morning until 5 in the evening without eating or drinking anything. That is that is impossible to them. And yeah. you know what? By the end of the, couple of the, the first couple of days of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, you know, they're, they're a little like your body takes time to adjust. But at the end of Ramadan, you, you're fine, you know, in, in many ways. Like you're, I, think the, the, I think the issue is, and I, I, I'm, since starting the club and starting to teach archery, I've learned a lot about myself, but also a lot around people. Yeah, of course. We live in a society where people want to be given a formula and just follow. They don't want to think for themselves. So, when I teach archery, I teach them the basics. But I always get a lot of students saying, but what's the right way? Or what's the stronger or correct way? There's three methods in archery, right? For a reason. The first method is a short, stout, stocky guy with fat fingers and a short neck. Second method, it was narrated that he was a medium built. And the third method, he was a tall, lanky guy with a long neck and long fingers. All these things lead you to, to, to see that not all of us are the same. Not all of us can be ulema. Not all of us can be uh, scholars, ulema. And not all of us can be farmers. Or not all of us can be scientists or scholars of other things. So we are all different. And we are trying to still solve problems in a materialistic way. Okay, sunnah. For example, fine, you look at fiqh, you look at sunnah, you look at all these things, but you're not looking at the original underlying factor of the problem. Because Islamic medicine teaches you to, for example, nourish yourself and then treat your disease through your nourishment. If you have a certain um, temper in your body, if you're a hot person, you will take food that is going to counter your hotness. If you are a person who has weakness or something, you will take hot food or some other things, okay? What you're saying there, oh, the sunnah is to eat little. Yes, sunnah is to eat little. But the underlying problem isn't in following just the sunnah. It is in approaching the sunnah. For example, why are why can't people understand that you don't eat from then un- from dawn till dusk? It's because they are afraid. Being afraid in Islam is something not, it's actually something frowned upon of these sort of things, right? Another thing is consumerism. Being hungry, being a hungry person and a, and a greedy person is also the, the Sufi scholars have taught us that this is a disease of the heart, so you should fight it. Being not generous and not sharing with others, another point. So people want to get a somehow get a recipe and not think for themselves and say, okay, this is the hadith, this is the sunnah, I'm just going to follow this blindly. We all fall into this category, generally, because the lack of our intellect and because of the lack of our understanding generally. We live in an inform, uh, in age of information, but we know the least. Yeah, we, we have got all information on our phones, and we know all the hadith more than our ancestors, but we don't live half of them. 
but our ancestors didn't know this hadith and lived them naturally. Why? How? Because they focused on the inner self and not on the text. So they understood hadith better than we understand them. Why? Because of the nature of their lives. They lived the deen. We speak it. We talk about it. We're talking about these problems. Yeah, we're trying you know, to, to understand. But you know, how many of us have actually made a sacrifice? How many of us have actually, I don't know, just gone out and hunt your own food, for example, experience it. Go out without anything, just water, for example. Go out and try and feed yourself off the land for three, four days. You would really go home and appreciate it. Yes, you would go home, have a great shower <laughs> and a massive meal, but you would, you would walk away from that a different person. So the, the core of the problem I don't think lies in intellectuality, science, or anything but spirituality. I think we need a spiritual shift, and I think we definitely need to address the spiritual attributes before we talk about the texts, hadith, and the different ulema, because they didn't, like, yeah, nine mor morsels a day. That's what the ulema are recommended to eat. Nine morsels a day. When you look at nine morsels, it's... It's a good amount of food people can survive on. But we focus on the nine morsels. We don't focus on why the nine morsels are the nine morsels or how do we get to the nine morsels. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So we, we are saying, okay, nine morsels, that's all I focus on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But I don't think about, okay, what's going to make me eat those nine morsels. So making that sacrifice, being brave. And when the ulema said, to be brave, you have to be generous. There's a reason for that. To be brave, generosity and braveness come hand in hand. For you to give, you have to be brave. You have to. Because you are, you have to, yeah, you're, you're giving. You're parting with something yeah. that you want. You are, yeah. Yeah. So the bird is not, like I, I like to use the term, bird is not um, relying on the branch when it stands on the branch. The, so when a bird goes and flies on a branch, it's not relying that the branch is firm, like monkeys. They have to ch test the branch before swinging on it, right? Birds, they just land on it, but they're not confident in the branch. They're just confident in, the, in their wings. So that's bravery, yeah? I so, think uh, yeah. Um, this makes me think that, like, for example... Um, when Rasul Sassam came with the Sunnah and the Quran, um, the following the Sunnah is like being one with nature, essentially, right? Like the world around you. So when the Meccans and stuff, uh, or the disbelievers rejected the Deen, what they were exercising, if you were um, taking from a spiritual lens, is um, ego arrogance, and that is essentially against nature. So essentially they are going against the sunnah as it is because it's not with nature. And that's why they didn't end up accepting it, if you get what I mean. So they're exercising uh, traits of ego and arrogance that aren't actually what nature uh, accepts. So in turn, they didn't accept the message. So people that were more in tune with what are with nature, with spirituality, like we know, for example, um, Salman Farsi, you know, he wanted to seek the truth. He was one with nature, right? And he found the way and he followed it. So it kind of links on that level as well, if you get For one. sure. For sure. Um, but like basic human instincts, fear, greed, all of these things give fruit to things like ego, pride and, and others. It's funny because um, I, I was doing some reading. Um, this might be... A, bit slightly off topic but um second discourse by rousseau he wrote like a uh, treatises on how he thinks it's funny all the people that are the backbone of secularism today even though they um atheists and stuff laugh at religious people for making stories but they're actually if you actually read their stuff they, their own philosophers made up stories um as well so he his story was how humanity got to where it is to civilizations and he actually proposed it's kind of islamic to an extent he's like um there's another philosopher skipping my mind he said that um we started from destruction and this and that which is the element of truth but from islamic perspective we had the fitra so we're already essentially i guess one with nature in that level right so rousseau said that humans were in peace uh when we like before we became a civilization we were like you know 
out in nature. We were like peaceful people. And then later on, um, after we had to make our own land and had to do all this stuff, the the emotions of jealousy, hatred, ego, all this stuff t- started to come about. So mm. it's kind of it's Adam really interesting. Salam, well. clear, yeah, clear story of Adam Alay Salam exactly, so and his two sons. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's what differentiates us from animals as well. And that's why we are um, eligible for Allah's mercy or punishment. Exactly. Because of the intellect of the man that makes us able to discern mm. right and choice. wrong and, yeah. and, and so forth. Yeah, that's what it's interesting. I don't know people are like, why is he talking about Rousseau? But anyways, it's because I read him recently. So he, he also mentioned that the difference, yeah, this is pretty Islamic as well, that animals only go off instincts and humans are only human because they have that free will and the intellect to kind of go against the instincts. So for example... I don't know, an animal sees food, they'll just, if they're hungry, they'll eat it. Like, it, they're not going to exercise some sort of, oh, I'm doing Ramadan, bro, 30 days, yeah, I'm not going to eat it, right? Animals just going to eat it, yeah? I have a cat, like, it sees food on the table, it just pounces on you, you know? Unless you're like, unless the human is like, no, don't do that, don't do that, it, it will just pounce on it, right? So, humans, you know, we have Ramadan, we follow it, we're actually going against our primal nafs or instincts as well, so that's what makes us humans, essentially, so... That's why Rousseau was talking. It's really interesting. He's right. You know, you know, because I was doing some background uh, research to how I'm like, this is kind of Islamic here and there, right? It's pretty interesting. But then I found out his grandfather or father was a watchmaker in the Ottoman Empire. Oh wow! <laughs> so there's some back history. So he had some. He wasn't like a pure um, fled, you know, Orientalist. He had some sort of touch with um, religions to that level. So it was, it was really interesting. Um, it's the same with little kids as well in many ways. That's why we, we talk about the children being upon the fitra. And it's because they, you know, like if a child wants something and you deny them that, they'll often cry. Mm. And that's because they're so dominated by their instincts because they haven't developed that intellect the same way that, you know, an adult would, an adult and a fully grown human would. See, but again, we go back to intellect because this has got nothing much to do with intellect. Mm. It's very spiritual. Yeah, in the in the in the, the spiritual meaning of intellect yeah, yeah, being, yeah. you know, slightly different from the kind of so people understand intellect in different ways. Yeah, at least it. like the way that today's intellect is understood, I, I would probably say spiritual discipline. That's much better. Yeah, the um, kind of the soul of definition of, of yeah. intellect being that ability to watch the self, as opposed to being able to discuss the theoretical or the or abstract. for the self to drive you to do things. That's even more and intellectual. Th- yeah, <laughs> you know, like it's. Yeah. If, mm. if you if you if you read some hadith of the Prophet <coughs> Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discussing what it means to be intelligent, you know, it's often quite different from how we would define yeah. an intelligent person in our society. Yes, you know, it's often referring to the controlling of the nafs, yeah, and that being the most praiseworthy quality of intellect and being able to recognize signs, which are of course these are all very deeply spiritual descriptions, and yet we've kind of moved away even in in the Islamic tradition. Mm. Not in so much in the tradition, but in the Islamic practice as it is today, from these definitions of intelligent, wouldn't you say so? And towards a more kind of inclination just, just towards. Just to slightly add before I um, like get you to answer, like this reminds me, I was thinking about this recently. It's really interesting that when you dialogue like with with people that are on the same um, level of faith that you are with you, or it could be a person from a different religion, right? Or when you just have a back and forth discussion, not like a hostile discussion, just to get their point of view and why they believe what they believe. What I've found is just really interesting. People will be rational at that point of time, right? But I'll give you a personal story. So there was this person that messaged me saying, there's this guy who's fallen, he's not in touch with the dean or he's, I don't know, becoming agnostic or whatever. And I think they wanted me to talk to him. So I'm like, cool. But then he, I'm like, just give me more, ex- um, tell me more about him. Like, what's he like? What's he saying? Why does he looking, you know, why is he feeling like he's agnostic or whatever? And they told me that, oh, it's because he says he was in science class and it's because of science. I'm like, I was really confused. I'm like, okay, is that <laughs> is that the best you can come up with? I was, then I, I, can't, I came to understand that he's not some intellectual, he's just some dude that's, likes the dunya and then he you know he, he just wants to do what he wants and islam restricts it and that's it but off the bat people will try to rationalize they won't talk about that they won't talk about that in enough they'll say your science you know i i was reading some science and you know they're saying some biology stuff about theory of evolution and 
but it's not. It's just a cover. It's just a yeah. It's just a wall they put up and they use rationality. For the underlying so like, problem. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So <coughs> I'm just like, hold on a minute. This isn't then. Is so all that dialogue that you see online with discussions and debates, those big name um, atheists or whatever you call it, mm. they're being rational and stuff. But is there like something underlying? Because it's it's kind of scary if you think about it, right? So you can't see like how we've come to see in the West. Oh, it's all about argumentation. You've got the arguments, rationality, reason. I've got to rebut your arguments and reason. But that's not how it operates. And even Rasul Sassam made that clear in how you get define intellect, right? Yeah. So small, like the view of like even in archery, and I keep going back to archery because it's it's my subject matter. I'm that's my expertise, and that's what I know best. Um, I'm no scholar of Islam or spirituality, just to make it very clear. Um, but looking at just through something like an art, like archery, uh, the West defines the word archery is comes from a word arcos, arcos meaning um, b- bow, yeah. Um, and all Western or, or West of the Balkans usually say archery from the word arcos in Latin. Anything West of the Balkans, they say, for example, in Bosniak, we say, uh, Bosnian, we say streličarstvo and most Slavic languages as well. Streličarstvo. It starts with the arrow. And again, it's the approach to a subject. And you asked me in the last episode, is archery spiritual in Islam? Anything that an Islamic person does, he can't help but be spiritual. You have to be spiritual, right? So in the West, they say to you, you are a body with a soul. Only recently they're starting to get into the soul business. So you are a body with a soul in the, in the West. In the East, they say you are a soul with a body. And your body is just a container for your soul to take you to the next step of your journey. So you can see the difference in approach through uh, manifesting itself through even an art like archery, let alone if you're talking about things deep like intellectualism and, you know, you know all those fancy words that you guys, mashallah, use. You guys are very... Uh, very educated, much more educated than me. So, um, so but for that's a lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's <not true. laughs> honestly, um, I, I think just keeping it simple and just looking at it in a simplistic way sometimes helps. And a, a lot of the people that went astray have um, are the ones that are th- that they think they are right and they think that they have the right formula. The problem is the formula and the thinking that you're right. Right, so then that that comes from again a spiritual sickness. So I think in the past, probably thirty to fifty years ago, we needed more knowledge. Now, knowledge as in information. Now we have too much information and lack of understanding. Yeah, there's oh. that even idea in the West: the ruh, the soul is only in the brain, and a lot of atheists have trying to push that out and Islamically even we have someone like even Sina that had the flying man theory that um to prove that the soul and the ruh exist so it's really interesting how like the east with the more spirituality and the fact that they were more close to nature would come with more uh, they had they were pushing for a more um, soul um, body oriented kind of discourse as well whereas the west is nah, it's just all pure body like I'll give you a bit of a strange example. I don't know if a lot of people watch cricket or not, but in cricket, right in the West, it's really interesting. It's even in sports, right? I I see it, and Raf would see it as well. That in the West, in Australia, England, New Zealand, when you're growing up, and when I play cricket locally, the coaches are so fixated on technique and this and um just all like okay, the ball's pitched here, your foot has to be here, your arm and shoulder and this that. Just all it's like very mechanicalistic right and you're growing up you're just thinking okay yeah sweet you need a good technique to play in all conditions or whatever you watch in you go Bangladesh India Sri Lanka no one has that kind of level of technique but they're probably better than the West right but it's really interesting because when you actually look at the Eastern countries they more focus on your mindset your temperament what's actually underlying it, that cause. comes before yeah, yeah the actual technique because you have all that technique in the world if your mindset's not there Mm. Yeah. Mindset's everything. 
like I was talking to um, I might mention this in the last uh, different podcast, but I'll mention it here again. I was talking to a in the past. I was talking to this. Um, he's like a sales help type guy. Um, he came uh, when I was working. Um, he was um, assisting like the sales team, and he had a lot of because um, he did psychology. He's like a consultant as well. So I had a good chat with him. Um, he was a big kick, cricket fan. He was really into psychology. I wanted to get some juice out of him, and I was asking him like, why do certain cricketers because uh, we both like cricket, so I asked him specifically about cricket. I asked him, like, why do certain cricketers like Sawag, um, if for cricket followers, Sawag's just a guy that has no technique. He's just smashing the ball. His feet are in wet cement yeah, the yeah. whole game. He doesn't and move his feet. He's, he's like, you know, 50 average in test coach. He's like one of the best going around. And there's so many players like that. You can give examples. Why are they so good? <laughs> they don't have the technique from a if a um, from the West's perspective. It's like they would struggle, right? Mm. But then he's like, you know what they feed off? They feed off um, energy. They have a good mindset. They also one of the big things is the crowd. Like they've worked their mind in a way to feed off the vibe of the crowd going around um, the stadium. And these are the sort of things that made me open my mind and my eyes to a different dimension and thinking of okay can't be all technique right it's not it, just mechanicalistic yeah. so it's kind of reflection yeah. of what we see in everything in exactly the it, yeah, it yeah. links it links mm. to exactly what i just said about how um anything that a muslim does should be becomes, spiritual. becomes a spiritual yeah. thing like because if you ask about the spirituality even if you're playing cricket if you're a muslim right the way you the way you swing at the ball like if you if you think about it right Cricket is an exercise in concentration, right? Yeah. It's an exercise in teamwork. It's an exercise in strategy. It can be very beneficial to you, right? It's not just a great waste of time in a sport. If you think about it as well in terms of, you know, making your mind and your body all entirely focused, right, and trying to make the connection. And, and I mean, obviously, it's nothing like archery, but it can be something of course, yeah, quite yeah, yeah, for sure. important and profound. And if you think, if you take the Islamic mindset and the Islamic spiritual mindset into anything, any sport – any activity then i think it can be it can it, you you will see quite a profound difference in it and i think yeah um, I, I think also in medicine is a clear clear example and but one thing i would like to i don't know if it's correct for me to say um add or correct with you um what you just said I, my view and maybe i'm wrong <clears throat> it is that of East opposing West more than Islam and non-Islam. Because mm -hmm. a lot of cricketers in Sri Lanka and others, they're non-Muslims. Yet course. they play the same way, yeah, in a spiritual way. Um, Japanese, Chinese. It's East and West. The way I see it isn't Islam mm -hmm. and non-Islam. Mm -hmm. I know that what you, I know what you're saying as well. Yeah, in, I mean, in many ways. Yeah, of but course. even archery, for example, archery. You've got non-Muslim archers who practice archery spiritually. Yeah, like my that. teacher is a non-Muslim, Mikhail Cosme. The Bo uh, Bulgarian, isn't he? But he's yeah. a Romanian. Oh, Romanian. He's yeah. from the Kipchak tribe. He's originally a Tatar. Oh. His ancestors fought in the Ottoman army. Were not Muslims. Yeah, of course. So a lot of the soldiers in the Ottoman army were not Muslims, but they fought for the right. They had a good internal balance and they said, okay, these guys are right. We're going to fight <laughs> with him um, because they, they saw more yeah. justice on this end. He's an orthodox, right? But he's highly spiritual. To, an, to, to some points we had the, like discussions that are deep. I could have discussions with him that are deeper than with some of my Muslim brothers. Of course. Because he was on a level. So I wouldn't probably say Islam Mm -hmm. against West or Islam against non-Islam. It's more just a, like the way that Indian medicine, for example, or even prophetic medicine or everything of that nature, they treat the cause, not the symptom. So in the West, they like to treat the symptom and not the cause. Mm -hmm. And they like to make money. Yeah, of course. Okay. And currently what the West identifies with is consumerism, capitalism and all these isms right quick um, fix you yeah know. quick bang get it done so they they recently did a on, on a sales they said you have to be ruthless you have to be the bad guy you have to be a shark you have to destroy you have to and that, that's how you make money <laughs> yeah that's it's true short term that's how you make money in your lifetime yes 
But what will happen to your children and what will happen in the long long run, they don't have that view. They, yeah. they just don't see that. So people like, you know, su- highly successful people today that are making a lot of money, they're making money and they're, they've got a lot of things. A lot of them are depressed. and uh, No, no, no. Uh, but look at their children. Yeah, yeah. Where are they? Exactly. What are they doing? With wealth. Because wealth, they sacrificed yeah. everything exactly. for their wealth. Well, and then you can then say in Islam, uh, the last prophet of all the prophets that we believe in, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came with a book that warns against uh, selling your spirituality for your dunya. Yeah, in Surah Baqarah. Uh, as far as I can remember. I, I think, though, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think that, <clears throat> you know, the East, and, and we mentioned India and Sri Lanka. I mean, the, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country, and India yeah, is yeah. obviously majority Hindu, but a lot of Muslims as well. And it's actually like, undeniably, Hinduism has been influenced by the Sawaf and the, and the Sufi Muslim traditions. I, I guarantee you that a lot of Hindu traditions are influenced by Islam. Um, and vice versa. Yeah, and vice to some extent, mm. yeah. But <clears throat> I would say that it's, it is spirituality versus non, like spiritual versus the non-spiritual. And, and the reality of the situation is that since the um, Reformation and the post-Reformation in Europe, it's not been the focus of the Europeans' life. Um, of course, yeah. I wanted to ask because um, we're throwing around sp- spirituality a lot and we're getting a little deep. But what would you? What is spirituality? Like, what would you define to be spirituality? Oh, what does it mean? You're asking me a heavy question. <laughs> there, <laughs> That's really. a big one. Yeah. What is spirituality? At I, I would in the morning. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, can I have a coffee? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know um, how to answer. Really, um, it's your. I think. The way that we understand, or the way I understand spirituality is to be in tune with the good and to know what is evil. And to be the master of yourself and not for yourself to be your master. Oh, that's deep. He didn't need a coffee after that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm not a mur- I'm not you asking the murshid, me, yeah, I'm not yeah. murshid. I'm, I, there's people out there who can you know they give you this um you know one liners but it's not in a sentence. It's not in a definition. It's it's you know it's in living it and then feeling it like for example oranges. If you never had an orange and I can tell you oh this orange is it's it has the color orange and you peel it and then inside you eat that and it tastes zesty and has this and that and you never had an orange or i could just take the orange and say here peel it don't eat the crust and eat the inter- Su- <laughs> sufism would say dog is that what yeah, it's well, yeah as ghazali talks about you know in the yeah so that's you know spirituality yeah you can talk to pe- people who don't are not aware of it all day long and they just but then you have people who are immersed in spirituality through some cataclysmic event in their life that they're like, oh, there's yes. something else. Yeah. And that's why part of Sufism is suffering. The key to your awakening is suffering. Mm. And humans through suffering. If you don't suffer, you can't burn. Yes. I mean, if you don't burn, you can't give light. And... If you don't suffer, you can't get enlightened. If you are too comfortable, you know, like, there's a funny, I, th- I saw a meme, meme the, not far, um, mm. not long ago, one of my students sent me a picture. He said, uh, hard times breed strong men. Strong men make easy times. Easy times breed soft men. And soft men make hard times. So it's like a cycle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's brilliant. Yeah. Ottomans, when they were hard, or they, when times were hard, you can see it in the architecture. If you go to Istanbul, if you go to Topkapi Palace, you will see it's very simple. In Bosnia, there is a place called Meitash. It means Meitash. Meitash means the dead body where the dead bodies would be washed there's a big stone and you put the dead bodies and you wash them yeah the sultans next to their throne on the way to the throne would pass Meitash it would be they would see the place where their bodies would be washed when they died 
in top, top copy, you go past, so that sultans to get to his throne, he would go past his place where he would be washed as a dead man and then go sit on his throne. Very simple, very uh, very easy accommodation, sitting on a very harsh, because they were still then a conqueror people and militaristic. And then as they progressed, you will see that the comforts increase. And then you, in the end, you will see neo-Ottoman a- architecture, which is a copy of the West. And today we are still trying to copy the West by saying, okay, we need more scientists, we need more this, we need, yes, we do all need these things, but we need a spiritual revolution, so to speak, so that we can co- go back uh, and understand what made us great. Of course. It wasn't knowledge alone. What do you think was the key to the Ottoman? I mean, you talked about, and you're obviously in the field of archery. Yes. How important was spirituality in the Ottoman military machine? Oof, immensely. Because it's not something we would traditionally think about in the West, is it? Growing up here and being immersed here. When you think military, you don't necessarily think like spirituality as well. But how mm. important was it in the Ottoman force? I think I mentioned this when the... the so the famed military unit called Janissaries, when boys like from your background and my background in the past would be taken as maybe nine-year-olds, to the training grounds, to the barracks. They would be situated, so they would all be in the academy and the first meal would be a soup or a shorba or something that's fluid and you can't eat with your hand. A big keg would be given to them and the unit would, all these young boys that don't know each other after this long trip, they would sit down to eat hungry as wolves, uh, as you can imagine in the past. They would all be handed uh, spoons that are a meter long, ridiculously long, all right? And um, they would be told to eat. There's no way you can eat with that spoon alone, feed yourself. So they would, and they wouldn't be told how. But they would figure out that to eat, I have to feed you because of the length of my spoon, and you have to feed me. So from such an age, first interaction would teach them to care for others. They wouldn't be bashed, they wouldn't be mistreated to make them hard soldiers. What It goes back to the concept of what is a soldier. In the West, soldier is a machine that goes in to destroy or uh, execute a certain task and usually associated with destruction. In the, in the East... It's associated with preservation. So there were men that were supposed to risk and sacrifice their lives to save others. If that meant, so for example, they were more about preserving and protecting, more than destroying. And again, we go back to the example of the Mamluk swordsmen, where they have, would have to cut a book and not just destroy the enemy, but rather wound or capture them alive and not having to kill. So it it just goes back to the whole concept of, yeah, there's a difference. There's a fundamental difference to approach what is a soldier and what is spirituality at at the end of the day. Um, The way that the Janissaries um, were educated, if you you do a bit of research, in the initial days of training was more theory. They were not just... um, they were not just training their body, they would be also training their mind. So yes, a lot of the uh, tariqas of old, uh, and, I'm, and I stress of old because a lot of the tariqas today have deviated from the sunnah and have deviated from sharia. It's unfortunate but true. Um, but the tariqas of old, they really focused on knowledge, on spirituality, of building of the self. And often units had certain tariqas that were associated with that unit. For example, Bektashi was a famous unit and they all, all practiced the Bektashi Tariqa. So for you to see how important and how they did that spiritual side with the Janissaries, you just have to look into the Tariqas. There are so many famous, uh, they call them Ilahilar, yeah? The the Nasheeds that were um, Bektashi Nasheeds yes. from the Janissaries that, that, are, that are still found today. They're, they're very, like, they're often... Very interesting. Like one of my favorites is one called Demedimme. Mm. 
mm. which is like do do you not know mm. and it's about uh it's it's a it's obviously shia because of the you know the inclination yeah. of the alavis even though the alavis of the past are nothing like, like the, the alavis today. of today yeah. the alavis of the past i would go as so far as to say is that the the earlier alavis many of them were like the awliya mm. especially you know and they were they were deeply pious men and they did perform their salah mm. and not like today if you mm. so for those people who are aware with modern turkey when i'm talking about alavis i'm talking about the old alavis and yeah. the, and the great poets and mystics of the past but there were such interesting songs because they were war songs right and they would sing them going into battle but they were always about uh like religious messages mm. and so when i when i started to understand that i th- i just thought it was so interesting because that's again not something that you would like if you think about it compared to the US Marine Corps and the sort of stuff that they would chant and sing on their way in well you know battle. what they what they played what sort of music they play the in Marine terms Corps, of heavy yeah, yeah, heavy, heavy metal, metal and yeah. You know, it always paints it paints a dem- demonic picture. Exactly, it's very satanic, um, isn't it? I, I I don't like to use those terms because I try to give people the benefit of doubt. But you know, it goes back to the point of east and west. Again, we go back to east and west, um, be it Islamic or non-Islamic. You know, um, but often the the Janissaries would uh, imbue their armor with religious messages, not only for the protection. and the baraka of these things but as a reminder you know sahaba used to rap uh, certain um, poet poetic rhymes about using a sword a battle is a hard place I, i as you would imagine you know it's a place where life is taken and where life is given so to speak um it's a place where men are men and it shows who is a man and who is not that doesn't mean a masculine a macho term it means who is human and who is not you know For example, in again in archery, in our concept, we're we're just heading to Bathurst to open the biggest archery festival in Australia, and uh, Australians have invited invited us, non-Muslims have invited us, archers, to open this festival as a as a cl- cross collaboration between two communities, so the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community, to use archery as a as a platform to get closer. It's very good in archery in our. So in the western archery you will find hunters they have a thing about heavy bows men want to shoot heavy bows to show their masculinity our scholars in eastern archery have told us it is unmanly to use a bow that's beyond your strength that's beyond your means and you would have pulled a bow both of you in the past if it's too heavy what happens to your hand it shakes But the point of that is if you use a heavy bow to shoot an animal your hand will shake you will end up either missing or even worse wounding the animal that is unmanly meaning unhumane it's not a humane kill but if your bow is is fitting to you it's heavy enough to make a clean harvest you will make a clean kill and you will be humane towards the animal do you know what i mean of course so what is manly and what is unmanly there's a clear difference of definition do you think it's different like the the islamic definition of being a man and and being masculine is different from the kind of western definition of being oh, for a sure man when we say man in islam it means human bar removing the ego and you know today masculinity is all about the ego the way that it's portrayed so there's a clear um picture that's being painted of um masculinity in islam that is understood by the west as masculinity with an ego the way we should understand masculinity is without the ego peace and then you will have real men or meaning real human beings that can be women or men a woman can be masculine a mother a mother can be a father and a mother at the same time can it not of course yeah. yes I was more scared of my mom than my dad. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, humanity isn't not, not isn't only reserved for men. But it's just the way that um you know, th- there's a lot of arguments you can go into and make and different things, but at the end of the day, I think the core issue of today in in approach essentially is the lack of spirituality as whatever you guys define it as, but it's a lack of awareness i'll take your definition it was it was very good <laughs> you know it's interesting because 
a lot of people might read our hadith when it comes to if men <coughs> or our humans are not worshipping Allah, they're the same, if not less than uh, animals. I think there's a hadith on this or similar to this. I think one of the scholars, was it Imam Abu Hanifa, had a a non-Muslim debater come to him and said, Oh, oh Abu Hanifa, who is greater, you or the dog? And his answer was fascinating. He said, um, and it shows the lack of ego there. He said, if on the day of judgment I'm resurrected as a believer, then I'm greater than the dog. But if on the day of judgment I'm resurrected as a non-believer, then the dog is greater than me. SubhanAllah. Because it, it kind of ties in, a lot of people will read them like, oh, that's so weird, or oh, non-believers being um, less than animals. But then I used to contemplate on this. But then I realized there's a lot of things at play, right? As a non-believer, if you only worship your desires or only go by your desires, that's the same, if not even less than an animal because you'll be less than an animal because you have the faculty of free will to act against your nafs, but you didn't. So 100%. essentially you become less than an animal because an animal doesn't have that faculty. It's only going off by its nafs. So what else it's going to do, right? So in that level... That's subhanAllah, like how the uh, the deen has worked that out to that degree, right? But on, not only on this, it's not even just an Islamic thing. This is discussed in philosophy. This is discussed in all traditions. Like uh, even Rousseau talks about this in, even in the second discourse I was talking about before. He mentioned that uh, humans have that capacity of intellect. So if they don't utilize it, they're essentially less than an animal. Because an animal, as I just said, like goes by its instincts, right? That's so, so true. SubhanAllah, you get to that degree, right? That's where you have to kind of attain a level of spirituality in order to surpass that level of just being nafsi type creature, animal, desires, hawa, yeah. all That's, that sort that of stuff. 100%. 100%. And uh, uh, recently, because I've, um, I've been, I don't teach horsemanship as much because I don't think I'm capable, but um, I read an article about horses that, and it says it's a it's a non-Muslim speaking um, that horses don't have egos, and I'm sitting there thinking, do they? Don't they? <laughs> because my horse is an Arabian, and she I would probably say sometimes has an ego. Uh, she's a funny horse, but what I'm saying is, this expert who who spent her life breeding and and tra- dressing dressaging horses and training them is saying. This animal doesn't have an ego, and that's what makes it so um, different in in her approach to the horse. So a lot of people approach horses as bosses. And she's arguing that we should approach horses as leaders. And there's a big difference. And she used Gandhi as a leader and Hitler as a boss. And she's saying, I'm not trying to paint a picture who's right, who's wrong. But she's saying... Leader will be sacrificial. A boss will sacrifice what's underneath him. So the, I, I don't know. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it, there's a big difference. It's, it's very profound. Yeah. Just give another example, right? Um, I was reading a bit of uh, Freud, um, Sigmund Freud, because he talks about um, the id, ego, super ego, which is very similar to. It's very similar to the Islamic version of the qalb and the nafs and stuff. So essentially what happened is that as human beings, uh, what Sigmund Freud talked about is that we as humans have that pleasure principle. So the pleasure pleasure principle is something in humans like we see something and we just do it because we enjoy it. But he says that um, reality is that that isn't feasible, right? Like you, for example, if you have like two thousand dollars in your bank account right now, uh, in terms of pleasure principle, we might as well burn it all now and do whatever you want. But you know that that's not going to work because how are you gonna feed your family? How are you going to pay the rent? All this mm. sort of stuff. So that's why he said that humanity has to start going towards the reality. Print. I think he called it the reality or rational principle. I forgot. But mm. humans 
have that primal instinct to start off, start off the, from the pleasure principle. Like, for example, when I first worked, you get four, $300, $400 your bank account you're like oh yeah nice i'm gonna <laughs> buy some nice shoes and it's gone and you're just like oh wait that's not gonna work in the long run so you gotta stick with the reality principle right so it all kind of links with spirituality as well because yeah. you can't live life with the pleasure principle right and when when um when people tell you don't look at the painting look at the painter yeah and they say oh sufis are devious because they meditate yeah but that's that, that's re- reality. You have to meditate in life. You have to have something to think. Actually, look at this uh, money coming into my account. Russell Wilson and then, yeah? meditated on cave. Uh, that's he how he did. got. Re- that's when he got he revelation. Did. You can argue this. You know, it's easily debatable <laughs> with people who are against the Sawaf and things of the spiritual nature in, in religion and take their religion very simplistically in a way that they just want a formula and apply it and that's it. And then they want to guarantee somehow. Very Western, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> um, but, you know, you have to. You, you, everything in your life around you is a warning or is a, is a guide. So if it's money coming into your account and leaving, or if it's a bird on a tree, it's your ability to see that that differentiates you from somebody who is enlightened and who is not. It's apparently it makes you think how Allah created everything in such a way, you know, yeah. it's, it's mind blowing, like, and how this current society that we're living in kind of forces you to live in that kind of primal or animalistic. It kind of ties in with why we eat so much meat because you know it's addictive. It all mm. ties it's together. Fun. I mean, we built a society, we built a dunya out of concrete, and and we we found a way to create artificial light. And now we think we're gods, you know, in many ways. We act in, a, in, in, yeah, in the manner. And, and that's it. And we've neglected the real nature of ourselves and, and the world and existence in all three of those spheres. I think when it comes to reading about scripture or revelation, what's happened is that in the West, there's a sort of level of ego where they think, Look at those backward texts in coming from the desert. What do they have to give to us in the modern world? It's funny. It's like their rejection for scripture or revelation comes from the ego as well. Kind of similar to the Meccans as well. Yeah. It's interesting how it all kind of ties. His, history yeah. repeats itself. Things you know? don't change. No, because as Ahmed mentioned, this is all about, you know, the spirituality and, and the lack thereof. And that's been the kind of dichotomy throughout all of history mm. and it's no different today as it was in the time of the of, of the many prophets the many the many um messengers and the reasons the same that, story the, the reasons so they were rejected you so know like how even allah made like you know stories in the quran the stories in general to really be timeless as well they are like, timeless yeah um Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, like the surah uh, in the Quran, the story, it's like it's one of my favorite stories, right? It's just like the end of the chapter, it's just mind blowing how it's just so relatable. Mm. I don't know, it, it just makes you think like, are humans really advancing as we think they are, or are we digressing? You know, it's it's yeah, it's very you know. It's very difficult to think about the future. I think um, you said you mentioned it before that it's a double-edged sword with yeah. the with the digital because we're not going to leave the digital embrace. My dad, my dad talks about the technological embrace. Once you're in it, you don't leave it. Do you, does your dad read Heidegger? Yeah, he does. Because yeah, Heidegger that's talks it. about it. Because he it. talks about technology. It's always going to improve, and we're never going to be satisfied. It's exponential, like, yeah. You know, we want that quicker never iPhone software. Yes, we get that quicker software. I don't know. We need some fingerprint thing to lock the, I don't know, the, the phone. Yeah, and then you need a face recognition, so you don't need the thumbprint anymore. So it's just, it's never ending. So even when AI exists, artificial intelligence, it's just going to be never ending either. Like we know the that pleasure principle. It's just the nafs. I mean, you're in IT. You would know the, a lot the about problem, this. The problem with that concept is that the never ending thirst. But we live in a world of, um, how do you say, 
with your resources and finite resources. Finite. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So we live in a world of finite resources. So they go against each other. So the question to those people would be what would happen when the battery runs out? Oh, well. <laughs> Also, we have no yeah. electricity. There, there are so we many have. possibilities. I mean, there, there are discussions Takes, of different yeah. solar patterns which could uh, do severe damage to... I don't know, just, a high, uh, just some idiot pushing a red button and making an EMP burst across the world. And then, you know, we all lose electricity for a month. What happens then? Disaster for... Well, people, people who are used to the technology and all that and that are not in touch with nature and that are not, you know able to fend for themselves or you know go to the forest and hunt they would they would go and resort those same people that are that are claiming the moral high ground to others in the desert or other places in the jungle um are going to be the first to go and kill their neighbor for food that's the only way uh, that they to would them. see yeah that's that's the only way they would see and then they would like oh i had to do it you didn't have to do it you didn't have to live your life you did but you chose to do it. It's your choice. Whilst other people would rather die than take another life. Would you recommend uh, young Muslims and young people in general, if there's any non-Muslims listening, um, that they go out and learn to hunt? For sure. Learn to not, not hunt, but survive. Learn. See how nature works. And do it safely. Okay, if you want to do something, do it through the right channels, do it safely. But if you want to learn, go study about, you know, nature, study what you can and not and cannot eat. Spend more time in the bush, go bushwalking at least. You will learn a lot. Um, our initiative is to focus on five arts in the community. Um, and those five arts are basically five um, characteristics of a human. It's not, so people, we say archery, yeah? Archery, horse riding, wrestling, swimming, and running. These are the, the five noble arts of our Prophet ﷺ. But, for example, archery breeds in your character. It breeds um, patience and devotion. Horse riding, it, it teaches you communication and leadership. And archer, the other thing archery does, very importantly, is it is... A nullifier to egos. To be proud and an archer and a good archer, you can't be at the same time. To be scared and on a horse, you can't be at the same time. So these attributes of those five sports, noble sports, um, they're noble because it builds a human being. Because, like I said, to be on a horse, horse senses your fear. You can't be afraid. You have to conquer your fear. To be a good archer, you can't be impatient or not devoted. And to be patient and devoted means to be humble. You can't be an ego and, and be devoted and patient. You know, these, these are the things that I would recommend young people to look into and study archery, wrestling. Wrestling teaches you knowledge of your capability and knowing that you are not the strongest. The inv invincibility complex today. Most young men in gen in gyms are invincible for 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 the lack of another word because they see themselves in a mirror in a shape of in invincibility. You put him up against somebody strong, really strong, like not big but strong. They will be very quick to uh, crumble. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, so the whole concept of you know those five arts, I would recommend young people to go out and study them with the right intention. Yep. And intention is key. Like, just to add to your examples you gave, it's like the world, to conquer the world, you have to conquer yourself sort of motto. And what I've realized, like I used to do sales like uh, four or five years ago. I used to do like door knocking, right? Um, what I learned, right, it was really interesting. You'd see other people, new people, like who haven't done sales before. They're really nervous, shy. They don't know how to speak um, well. And they don't, have that passion for the product already right how are they gonna sell like it's really interesting right like if you don't have belief in the product yourself how are you gonna tell people to buy it so then when they are uh complaining about oh this is such a rubbish job i don't want to do this i hate this it's like wait a minute <laughs> no it's not because it's a rubbish job and you hate the job it's because you're not good at it and 
you didn't exercise those traits to be good at it. It's really that simple, right? So you can take that to just, I guess, all walks of life, essentially. Like, it's about conquering the self. Even with people, like, for example, I know people that are struggling in life, um, emotionally unwell. Obviously, mental health is a um, problem. We should treat it. A lot of the problems that we see in, when it comes to anxiety, right, it's a lot of people that are already too worried about something that'll happen in the future or something that happened in the past that affects the present. Mm. So it's about conquering your mind in that state to always be present in the moment and to not just be worrying about something in the future or that. So it's about having your emotions in check. Mm. And I think that's also a sense of mastery. I know like Allah will make people differently so it will be harder for someone compared to someone else but it's essentially coming down to do you really have a mastery over yourself? Because if you're just worrying about something that might happen in the future, then how are you going to combat that issue when it does happen in the present, right? Like, mm. it becomes really problematic. So, it's like, it links to everything in life, not just, you know, the sports you play or whatever. Even um, when I play sport, when I play cricket, sometimes it's a very mental game. I'm not mo- much of a short, um, for, uh, short format batsman. I'm not like a big hitter, but I'll score when I can. But in the long format, right, it requires a lot of mental fortitude. And you realize, like, if you're worrying about something that happened last night, you had some fight or argument with a friend, and you come to the field, and you get out, and you go out and say, oh, yeah, I just got out, this and that. But you have to analyze all those things and kind of put it to the side and think, okay, I'm just going to play cricket. I'm going to put everything at the door. So whatever struggles I'm happening in life, I want to bat well. If your mind is focused to that degree, there's no reason why you can't do well. But if you let other things in your life get to you that's not even happening in that present it's going to affect you so mm. much i think you mentioned that actually that when when we did go to maidan you mm. actually talked about how when you're doing archery you have to be present and and in the moment and the target or, or out of the empty yeah. mind and you can't bring with you mm. what you had yeah, yeah. And, and so true when you're fired yeah that's that's 100% um you have to be in the moment yeah when perhaps I don't know to a degree of psychology in the West, but it's very mechanical, mechanicalistic. Because I know when I was doing psychology, right, I went, not doing it, I was like reading about it. I wanted to get some grounding because I realized with the information that's there, if you take it on board, there's a lot of um, conflictions with Dean. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of piece by piece work out what's the actual underlying issue. So alhamdulillah, when you study philosophy, study a bit of psychology, study a bit of Dean, um, have your aqidah in check, you get to understand, uh, even science as well, philosophy or science, how it all operates. Then you get a grounding, okay, this is why they're, where they're going wrong and this is where we have a correct. And subhanAllah, it gives you that all round, uh, well-roundedness. So when I was looking into psychology for a bit, I realized that there was hidden shirk, like kufur, like in the sense that they will, put, like yeah. I guess it's right, like in the sense that when your brain gets damaged, there is aspects that get damaged. But then it's not just, but then what they infer from that is hard determinism or hard like physicalism that there's no rule like you get what i mean it's yeah. it goes down a dangerous path if you don't have your aqidah in check but then you realize that you look more in depth into the um studies you realize that there is actually cases to prove that their soul exists but you won't get taught that because that field of study wants to portray in a certain or the west in particular right so I don't know where I was going with that, but... <laughs> the, the the thing what you're trying to, I, I think, say is the argument isn't about whether the soul exists or not. The argument is in relation to definition of good against evil. Mm-hmm. Because the good is clear and the evil is clear. The good is where we try to um, control our desires which are evil and if we let the desires and if we control those desires we become good but if we let those desires control us and uh, submit to our uh, nature uh, naturalistic sort of desires we become evil because we do evil things then so that's that's the essence of the argument it's good against evil and we're not trying to portray it in a way of islam against non-islam yeah it's it really is uh humanity whether you are a human or you are not. If you kind of, a lot of people, they don't even know that they're following the desires. That's the scary part. And they think they're doing good. Mm. 
so it kind of shows that it does come down to spirituality to attain truly what is good mm. and that's what's missing in the west as well do you get a lot of non-muslims uh, this is kind of going to relate but do you get a lot of non-muslims down the archery club um we get a few um not a lot because um we essentially we're ottoman style club or bosnian club as well so it's behind um, the bosnian uh, it's behind place. yeah it's our behind yeah and um but for example on the 25th uh, there is a non-Muslim flying from Melbourne. We had guests from Brisbane. We had guests from Tassie, um, all over Australia. So the the non-Muslims who come to our club are really passionate and they are really thirsty and hungry for knowledge. On a wider scale, we have a huge thirst in the archery community for a spiritual aspect of archery. There is a massive th- thirst for that because a lot of these guys are hunters and a lot of these guys have a feeling and I want to practice this art with a spiritual slant, um, and they never had it. So when they saw us, they they absolutely loved us. So the 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 reception that we have in the non-Muslim archery community is phenomenal, because they are really hungry for something like this. They've been looking for it all their life. All all of them, I tell, uh, they say they say these things. You know, they're like, I've been looking for this. My whole archery journey has led me to to meet you like this to me. I went, oh, cool. So <laughs> what does you know? What? And he's like, well, this. And then he explains how he practiced. I don't know a Japanese martial art, and that he goes, I get fulfillment from that. But from this style st- style of archery, and he shoots longbow. <laughs> he he's like, I, I don't get that because it's viewed as a tool. I went, yes, it is a tool, but for what? It's a tool for making you a better human. Or is it a tool for just sed- sed- um, sedating your desires of eating and all that? So there's a difference. But we do get some non-Muslims. We're lucky to have them because a lot of them are ex- exceptional, accomplished, successful, and good people generally. You know, um, But we're very lucky in the club that we have good people all around in Maidan. The reason I asked is because I think it's such a, you know, obviously... I think it's said on every single podcast, this is a difficult time to be a Muslim in a difficult place to be a Muslim. But, <laughs> you know, in terms of the hostility against the Muslim community in, in some parts of this country um, and among some elements of this country. But or would you would you agree with that necessarily or would you feel that it's quite receptive? Because the thing is, I, I just see archery as a great way of, of breaking everything down and really... Um, teaching people the kind of fruit of spirituality. I agree. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's meditation. In a, in a demonstrative way, yeah. not in a theoretical way. Yeah. And I think that that's so important. Physical. It's yeah. yeah, exactly. It's so important because you can tell people, you know, I'm a Muslim, this is what I believe. But if you can show someone mm. how your beliefs influence and, and inform any action and, and any discipline, right, be it archery or, or anything else, it's it's so much more profound, isn't it? I've got something to add. Like I've had this conversation with a friend a lot and I think one of the biggest issues as Muslims that why the deen has not spread to the degree it has in the West specifically when people you know, have some sort of Islamophobia is because what we did is we have, I don't want to name specific groups, but I'll say like there's a specific type of Islam that's very rigid in the sense that it's all or nothing in terms of culture. So what's happened is I mean, that... What have is. <laughs> I don't call them Salafis and Wahhabis. Yeah, so you have that very rigid type of Islam where it's interesting because even they ad- adopt Arab principles. So it's very rigid in terms of culture as well. There's no sort of culture flexibility. But we know, if we just look at history, how you know Islam spread in Spain, how Islam spread in like Malaysia, Singapore. I think it was in, uh, sorry, not Singapore, um, Indonesia. I think how we got. Islam spread in Singapore is through the puppet shows where puppet shows were very popular in Indonesia and Muslims made puppet shows about the Sahaba and the stories. Really? Yeah, yeah, subhanAllah. So that's one of the many, many cultural aspects that we were able to ease into society and just, it's like a glove, you know? Islam was just a glove people just put on and it, it just slipped into society. But now in the West, what we've done is just Islam, you know, you've got this, 
you're, why are you always wearing thobes and jubbas? You don't have to wear it. It's just, I don't know why we wear it, right? Even the sunnah is not necessarily that either. It's just it's what we think closed, standard. Yeah. I personally wear it time to time because my cultural issue is that with Bangladeshis, a um, lot of non-practicing brothers, they wore the cultural dress to like free mix and do haram. So kind of wearing the it's just Arab the kind of dress. jubba shows that I, I feel like I'm becoming a bit more pious, uh, not pious, but practicing and trying to lean towards a better direction. Mm. But how Islam's meant to be is that we're meant to ease into society in all cultures. In um, There's a funny... Um, there's a Shashi Thapur. He was at... Uh, Shashi Thapur, yeah. He, I, I showed you that video. It's like him he had a round table discussion with uh, Sat, uh, Sat, Satguru yeah, yeah. He, that guy man. <laughs> Sat, I don't know if you know do you know about Satguru he's a very spiritual guy he's like uh, he's a Hindu. yogi he's very interesting oh, cool. you, you'd All like right. him you'll like him so he's a very spiritual guy so that a round table Shashi do you know Shashi so yeah. I'll, I'll explain so he's a guy that wrote books about what the British did to Indians and just wrote like books on it and he's very good speaker so he ah, can Ah, but he's a non Muslim, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's a yeah, yeah. Indian. I've, yeah. I've I've seen a video about this guy, about you know, education in India and yeah, yeah. all so that. He's very big on that. Wow. But currently okay. he's a politician in India. So he had a round table with Sad um Giri, Sadguru. So and Sadhguru was very spiritual Hindu type yogi type master. So Sadhguru seemed like he had some like anti-Islamic vibes. He said, um, we mustn't forget what the Muslims did to us as well. Because the conversation was, uh, um, should we just forget what the British, the British did to did, us? Yeah. So he's like, ah, uh, yeah, you know, and we can't forget about what the Muslims did and, to Indians. Yeah, and what did Shashi Tharu say? He said, they became us. They came to our lands and they became us. Mm. And what happened is that the British looted everything and took it back to Britain, whereas Muslims, yes, they took over India, but they kept everything they in integrated. India. They integrated. They yeah. integrated. Literally, the culture, like even me, like I'm Muslim, I'm from the subcontinent. Our culture is like, literally, I'm Muslim. Yeah, like, we d- all three of us sitting here, we all have different cultures. Yeah. Very different Very cultures. Very interesting. So, all you need is the trip from India to Tehran to Istanbul and you will see the spiritual journey of Islam. We just incorporate like, there'll be those picky rulings about wearing, making sure you have your belly button covered yeah. or whatever. I was going to say, yeah. but you use the culture, it's still the same. You know what mm, I mean? There's no, little mm. f- very detailed kind of picky rulings. We just, in- we, we make sure we follow those rulings but it's not a complete overhaul. It's not suddenly that India's all wearing jubbas and yeah. going around white dobs and whatever, right? So, it's really interesting. I do wear thobes occasionally because they uh, allow me to pray easier. Like if you're if you're yeah, a yeah. bigger dude, um, sometimes <laughs> it's hard when you have like when you have your pants, like your your shirt and your pants can separate mm, and you can expose yeah, yeah. your older. Yeah, yeah. So wearing like long clothes and that's part of the sunnah but as well. Your clothes shouldn't be form fitting. But the but issue you can, is like with um, non-Muslims looking at Muslims, they the think idea, that's yeah. like a attire. Yeah, <laughs> that's same. like a farb the attire you have to wear. Like, only it's, it's funny because I was um, I was with a brother. In a boxing match, and you know, I was asked, or he was asked, why, why, why do you wear what you wear? Is this, you know? She asked him, you know. I thought quite rudely, but he 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 treated it very nicely. And um, it's funny because her daughter was tatted up from head to toe, and I felt like saying to her, "Does her tattoos?" you know, give her a certain status? Because she was asking, do your clothes give you a status in your community? <laughs> like, well, I mean, it's, like, what I about your tattoos? Question. Do they give you a status in your community? <laughs> yeah. It's just an outward yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, the Prophet, is, awesome. he, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but he warned against the people who would look like Sahaba, dressed as in their dress. The Kufar and the, uh, dressed the same dress way. And yeah. beard would be like ours. And he said, and their head would not leave the ground. And they would fast the day and pray the night, but wouldn't get anything but hunger and sleeplessness from these things. And they would recite Quran and it wouldn't leave the area of their throat. This is the Khawarij. Yeah, the Khawarij. And who are the Khawarij of today? It's the same people who act the same way as the Khawarij do. Meaning, they focus on the outwardly, saying Sunnah, okay, it means I have to go outward in. So I'm going to wear sunnah, grow my beard, and just be a complete tool to the society by enforcing all these things, outwardly things, and not even talk about why we do these things. This is the khawarij of today. And you mentioned as well how there's three different madahib in archery. Yeah, this is rahmah. Exactly. And, and it's because there are different types of people. And it's the same with, with fiqh. 
Yeah. And and the dean as well, even it's in interesting. Like this reminds me like shout out to Mad Ron Lux. They did an episode with a Sheikh, um uh, name skipping my mind, but he he was a uh, Spanish, I think, in descent. Oh no, I think it was from Portugal, Spanish, Spain. Anyways, so you know obviously Muslims lived in uh Portugal, right? In in the past. So I think they were following the Maliki Madhab back yeah, th- yeah, they, they were so, in yeah, so what happened was that like, they was had their own in Andalusia they had their own scholar. Yeah, exactly. So what happened was that because um he fought fo- um the sheikh who converted, um he was following like Salafi fiqh, it was taking he was doing dawah back in his country, but then he realized the fiqh doesn't actually suit these people. people. So then he actually became Maliki <laughs> and he kind of eased into society a lot better. He said like, look, the the culture here is that the wife can be like in the same room as the friends of the husband, right? Like I think Salafi fiqh is different, but anyways, he's saying that it's just not going to work. The culture here is just, it's so it would be so odd. Yeah, but that's like the madhabs are like rahma in that it sense. It is. So that's in why a, you see in like Africa, yeah. uh, especially uh, with the issues of tahura, uh, like uh, of tahara. There are main a lot more issues with tahara, and uh, also the uh, aura in Maliki is a lot smaller than it is in let's say Hanbali. Yeah, we can uh, we can. As notably, we like we can show our knees and, and yeah, that's yeah. what Raf walks his dog and wears shorts. Obviously. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm walking. <laughs> I'm walking around with my dog. So you're Maliki. Maliki. Because yeah. right. in Maliki, as yeah, I can also have dog hair all over my clothes and just offer salah. Like it's not even a problem. <laughs> Very poor Hanafi is running uh, away from dogs. Mashallah. <laughs> 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 but it just shows, like, excuse me, Hanafis can have dogs. Yeah, they can. Um, but if it has a purpose. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's the same. Even we like, love dogs. We we're not against yeah. like we don't kill dogs. If yeah, people yeah, yeah, yeah. are, it's just know, it's thinking. just the subcontinental people. I think with their culture, they're kind of like more averse to dogs. So they've imposed their kind of aversion to dogs yeah, yeah, onto are, the religion. Quite, yeah, even though there's no, and it's actually the same with the Maliki Madhab. Like you're not recommended to have a dog, uh, for no reason. Yeah, you, you like what you shouldn't take an animal and just put it in your house and, and no, just leave no, it there. Like course. that's wrong. Um, you can have it as a guard dog. You can have it as like a companion Reason, yeah, dog. Yeah. yeah, and but the only difference is, I'm pretty sure between the madahib is that the fur and the saliva of the dog, according to the that's madahib, more, isn't yeah. najis. Yeah, know? yeah. Because they were used for hunting. Yes, and and yeah. the and 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 the Quran. In Bosnia, yeah. it's notorious. Yeah, a- and the the sh- the what do you call <laughs> the pleasure, the real pleasure of hunting mm-hmm. is in a good horse and a good hound. Really, that's a real hunting. That's the beaut- the most beautiful hunting you can ever experience is if you have a good hound, and you hunt together. That would have been that. That's, that'd be such a fantastic experience. Yeah, it, it just goes to show, like the point being that you shouldn't be having that mindset of Islam as it's my way or the highway, and that's what's actually happened but in the West. That's ego. As well. That's not even that's not even Islam. That's just that, the ego. That's true, you know? and that's what we see why as Muslims we haven't flourished in the West as we would have liked to because we haven't fit in with the culture in the West and presented Islam through that culture. So like it's like I guess we're doing it now, you know, we're having like teas with nice Arabic symbols <laughs> and skateboards, I'm sure like they're into that Arabic kind yeah, of culture, yeah. uh calligraphy, all that sort of stuff. It's only just happening sort of recently, but in the past it was just you're completely yeah. different from the West. You know, you stay away from it. But you've got to kind of present Islam where um in a way where it's just like, yeah, you know, I believe in God or so some is a prophet this is, seems like a beautiful, you know, culture yeah. to it. Except it should be that it's not just oh I'm at odds with, you know, everything that is going around me. If you get what I mean, That's, obviously it's limited. Yeah. It's not like oh we're gonna make alcohol halal. But just sudden, like but just even gonna... doing something that you like, like having a passion like Ahmed does, and and having a skill in archery and just performing that skill, people will recognize him for that. As a participant of the society, mm. and even in the work you do, you know, mm. people recognize that, and they will they will see like, you know, it's it's a cliche, but it's like you're you're a human being and you live a life according to a tradition of the mm. tradition of Islam and the tradition of the prophets, um, uh, all of them. Uh, yeah. So, it's like I think if people recognize that and they see that, then that that's such a good way of just uh, sort of portraying the religion. Yeah, so much better than handing out pamphlets and hounding people at the station, you know. Right, but the West has a term for them, Bible bashers. I think. Yeah, yeah, but we have them yeah. now too. You know, I think that that that's 
So interesting how Muslims have adopted that approach to, to We're not taking the good da'wah. We're taking the bad. But that's it. But literally, they. But they not, not to, like, you know, a lot of people do hard works with the da'wah sense and all that. I will reward very everyone for yeah, their efforts. Definitely and honestly, important. there are people out there in the da'wah community who are doing so much hard work to raise awareness about the basic points of islam it's just your point is that we're not doing taking other avenues but it's, what my point is, is on that, that you know? is it necessary is that as effective as just being a, a righteous and upright individual right who is whose good qualities can be seen by all people in everything they do i'll give you like another example <laughs> right like even like i'm really into like in kind of the business world and kind of how entrepreneurs do well so i'm reading a lot about that and you know the books the self-help books and stuff but then i'm just thinking this is literally all like the sunnah like subhanallah like they're following their optimal level is just following the sunnah i'm like but they've packaged it in a way even though they, they don't know it's a sunnah but i'm saying they know that getting the most out of it they follow these kind of steps and principles but you can just easily link it with the sirah right so they follow to the t and they make books that are that uh people in the west can vibe with can kind of relate to Whereas maybe if people wanted to know about how to be an optimal Muslim, in the um, if a non-Muslim wanted to read how to be an optimal um, person and read Islamic books, they're not gonna. It's gonna be like a hard. They have to read this book Arabic and translate or whatever, right? So we haven't made it accessible for them in that level. So it made me. Int- uh, I was just fascinated. I'm like, there are people, you know, all the entrepreneurs are like to wake up 5 a.m do meditation 20 30 minutes like that's fajr prayer the sunnah mm. you know you can even do tajr like 10 minutes before that read um your daily litany um read quran as well it's all recommended right all duas and stuff and then they say um even th- there's this fad now like you have to eat little because it helps with your concentration you know that's the sunnah even there was a funny um i don't know if people know i don't know if you know tay lopez he's like really big on facebook uh he's like an entrepreneur really sorry rich guy. i don't know all the all people good. you say so he's he's pretty big uh at the moment and he he even said like i, I was digging some of his tweets i said like maybe he because he reads a lot he, he has this motto of read a book a day so i'm like maybe he's read something about islam so i just typed tay lopez islam and he came up with uh he didn't really talk about islam but there was a comment he he did a tweet saying you know, every time, I mean, fi- when I was in financial difficulty or some um, issues, I would just give charity. And for some reason, I always got a lot of money back. Um. And then someone commented like, oh, um, Islam, this is, you know, I think he quoted some hadith or something. So I retweeted on the Boys in the Cave one um, on our Twitter recently. I'm like, so wow, this is, this is literally like the, what <laughs> Russell Sam told us. He's like, your money will increase. If you give charity, not decrease. That's a very good saying. Like, even yeah. though from a logical, this goes back to the West and the East. You know, the West be like, oh, you spend money, um, you give money to charity, so technically you have less money. So if you rationalize it, that makes no sense to give charity if you want to be successful because you have to have as much money as possible to make that investment. And this they, look, that. they look at charity <laughs> as tax te- deductible. Yeah, yeah <laughs> there's that. <laughs> they look at charity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so That's funny, isn't it? Yeah, it I remember no, I, yeah, exactly. when they tried to sell me charities, like you know those people who come around you know those people who come around and they, they, they're like, Oh come sign up for Make a Wish Foundation, you know? And a lot of those charities are good, you know, they're mm. helping children or whatever. But the way the woman sold it to me is like, Oh, and by the way, this is all tax deductible and I was like <laughs> <laughs> So she's like, You'll get it back at the end of the year. So I'm not even I'm not even giving charity. I'm just lending my money until my tax returns yeah, come exactly. back. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I yeah, get it back it anyway. to, but like the point being is that you know we have the sunnah, but we haven't presented it to the West in a way where it's palatable for them to just ease well, into. Well, we need to figure it. we need to figure that out um, amongst ourselves. I don't think we, we haven't really embraced the sunnah ourselves to present Swallow. it in the first place. <laughs> we got we, us. We just got smashed. <laughs> I'm, I'm included with you guys. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not outside. No, no, we, we're out here talking about how are we gonna, how are we gonna do it? And he's like, we haven't even fixed ourselves. <laughs> like, yeah, damn. Sidi <laughs> uh, Ahmed here is on a different level. He's like, la ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. Um, but yeah, I don't know where this um this idea of uh, food, not eating food, sharpens your mind. It seems to be lost on me, man. Because if I don't eat breakfast, so what's for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Like, if I if I haven't eaten breakfast, yet, I'm just sitting here. I'm like. So mm. what will I eat? Maybe Mexican food? Do I want Mexican food? You know, I'm here trying to talk about the dean, and you know, all I can think about is burritos. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> all the <bit. laughs> But alhamdulillah, you know, I think um, it would have been good if you came over my place. You would have enjoyed it. 
I've, I, yeah. <laughs> I, what, what, do, what is Bosnian food, actually? That's an interesting question. Well, it's, a, it's a fusion between Turkish and... Would have a long, strong Turkish influence, yeah, I'm very sure. very strong. I know Savaps. Chevap. Yeah. yeah. We, we barbecue a few Savaps yeah? at home, yeah. Yeah, you love it. Um, Chevap. And like, I like th- strong breakfasts, um, weaker lunches, and, um, and at the end of the day, um, the, least you eat, the less you eat, the better. See, same yeah. with Italians. They have a lot of food in the morning and at lunchtime. Yeah. They have a big lunch and a small, small dinner. Very yeah. small compared to lunch. I think that's that's the way Fa- it used farmer, to be. Farmer style eating. Yeah. yeah, but it does not work with cholesterol levels of office workers. No, it would not be very <laughs> you good. You go to the office, you eat like that, you're prescription for a heart attack. Yeah. Also, um, you'll be asleep at three o'clock because yeah, that's what yeah, they, you know, that's yeah, what we do. Three o'clock wall. Yeah. You go, you go to sleep after, after you eat lunch. But yes, yeah, it's so true. It is so true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the other, the other thing is, um, food, I guess it's all, it's, we, we shouldn't misunderstand our desires, but also, we should not sort of when people come over to to our house food should be a means of making people welcome and it's a means of showing our generosity and sharing so if we share in excess that's fine i think food really is a personal matter so that you know when you are alone am i gonna take this extra snack or not am i gonna you know be disciplined or not um in communal um as the ulema do, when we're in a community and we, we eat together, we eat. We You let loose, you eat. Um, and that part of that is is the spiritual side of, to some people, eating this food is kasar nafs. And to some, it, not eating this food is kasar nafs. So it just depends on your situation. I think community, it's a really interesting topic. Um, reminds me of when um, we had Brother Hoblos come on the podcast. He mentioned a story where back in the days what they'll do like when the milkman will come around they'll just put the money or the coins on a two dollars three dollars they'll put it on in front of the house just leave it there and in the morning it would come back the money's gone but then the milk would be there so that level of trust was there because of the community so it's interesting how now we live in those times where people are like oh yeah we need i don't know security cameras and front door cameras and fear they, but they say oh it's because of security and they justify which is good and all but then at the same time it's because we've closed ourselves off so much from our community. If we had that, let's put the cameras to the side. Let's just say everyone knew each other. Everyone trusted each other. The community was strong. We don't need, why would you need um, the cameras? Because you would know the thieves in the community, right? You don't have to necessarily need, put all this like technology out there. You get what I mean? So like, now Omar had, is it 11 patches on his clothes? And was sleeping under a palm tree when the emissary of the Roman Empire came to him. He had zero guards around him, and this man was just gobble, uh, you know, gobsmacked, saying, "This is the Emir al Mu'minin, like this, no throne, no grandeur, no pompous, just chilling under a palm tree, ca- yeah. catching a rest." There's one that Ed- Edward Gibbon, who's a famous Western historian, talks about. Teacher you know, of how, Edward, uh, he was John Locke, inspired yeah, by John Locke. He was, yeah, he was that big, influence. He, was, he actually he was really tied with the Islamic. Yeah, yeah, he did. He really community. liked. He really liked Omar ibn al Khattab, uh, and he actually mentioned a Persian emissary came. Persian, that's yeah, it. Yeah, no, the, he found him. He found Omar asleep on the steps of the masjid with all the poor people. Yeah. Uh, and well, you he, get the gist. He you know, couldn't like, believe it, you like, know. Dude, this guy's yeah. leading. He said you know, that this is this is the Amir al-Mu'minin asleep on the steps with all the with all the with all the poor people in the in, in the front of the masjid. I that, mean, that reminds me in the Ihya, I think in the in the beginning of the Ihya, it mentions the relationship between the scholars and the leaders, and he said the leader is bad if, sorry, the sheikh or the scholars are not fit to be scholars if they are going to the leader. Whereas the leader should be going to the scholars. Like yeah. It should be in the scholars' time where the leaders go and visit and learn what they need to learn. Mm, mm. And I guess in this day and age, it's like the opposite as well. Yeah. So it goes to show the characteristics of leadership as well um, for the Muslims should be about 
going to the scholars you know and the and scholars and embody the to soul wolf and the going back to and knowledge and going back to practice and and understanding i think that's that's literally what we've touched upon today and that that's the basis of everything is just going back to the basic understandings of spirituality and understanding ourselves and, and our drive and, and drivers intention drivers yeah. what's your take on imam ghazali I know because you're a big Sufi well, guy, so... Uh, what do you mean? What's, we're actually, what's, we're your, actually, what's your thought? Like, we were actually talking before and you were telling me that about the importance of the Ihya in modern times as well, I remember. Yeah, yeah Ihya is very important. And I, as you know, there's certain people in, in Sydney teaching it and I approve Can you just quickly tell people like a quick what's the Ihya for listeners that might know? What is the Ihya? <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> what is Islam? <laughs> <laughs> just quickly. No, just for, yeah. for the audience. You know, for non-Muslims, Muslims that are getting into Deen as well. I I really don't I don't mean any disrespect, but I don't think I'm the right person to ask. You should <laughs> ask Sheikh Hassan. Yeah, mm-hmm. people like that. You know, I'm yeah. I'm no one. This here yeah, is is it's a great book, and <laughs> it's a great you know, book. <laughs> mashallah, everybody should study it. But what is it? What does it mean? And all that. I I really feel. Embarrassed to answer your question. Okay, questions. so in what way is the Ihya kind of why do people need to <laughs> rephrasing the question? Yeah, I'll rephrase change it. it now. Yeah, it what doesn't change anything. <laughs> I think, look, the, it, it, it's just a different avenue. I, I think Ihya is only one of the ways to enlightenment. Um, how people attain it is is according to their journey in life. But if if anybody is, is hungry to learn about Tasawwuf or feels that there's a gap in his life, in his practice of the religion, or feels afraid when he sees something new. If you see somebody practicing deen not the way you do, and you try to correct them immediately, go and see guidance. Or if you are so afraid that if somebody's, I don't know, um, looking at a different perspective of the religion and then your knee-jerk reaction is to correct them and not look inwardly, then go see a scholar about learning about Ihya or things like that. Um, These are telltale signs of, you know, your own problems. Um, But I think fear, after greed, fear is the biggest problem in our community. Fear. What sort of fear do you mean specifically? Of anything different, being afraid. Fear, the definition of fear. How do you, comp- because I think a lot of people when they start something new or do a new job, there's that bit of fear. So what's your kind of uh, advice for combating fear in general or in an overall sense? Luckily, fear is something that you acquire and it's not something, it's like a muscle. It's something you exercise. So the more you push yourself outside of your comfort zone, the less fear you will have and more bravery you will have. So the, re- the antidote of fear is action, is going against. Good sailors were never made in ports. Yeah, we know the saying. But it means that you have to push yourself, risk your life to become something greater. And it's again, going back to the spiritual thing of burning. You have to go against your desires. Fear is going against, you know, f- to fight fear is to go against your desires. Beautiful. Like, um, there are also like with, with sin- this reminds me of sins in general, right? A lot of people, how how Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. People think that there's sin and that's the end of the world, but Allah allows you to turn back and turn back, even though you may fall into the same sin. So it's like a muscle as well. In that sense, you know, it always, it, yeah, Allah 100%. gives you that flexibility to, you know, not to sin, but in the sense that turning back to Him. And, and we, we should, should be the same. We should be more flexible. I think we've uh, touched on a lot of amazing topics. So this was an amazing episode. It's, been, but it's honestly been one of my favorite episodes to record. With, Mashallah. With, with, Khair, it's it's always, Thank it's always you. <laughs> I think it's, I think there's, I really a, there's a number of reasons. I think, you know, um, we do know a bit about you before. I've met you before very briefly. Um, 
I've uh, Ahmed's fed me. Yeah, and Josh uh, in the past. So. Yeah, yeah. So there. Yeah. So I you, you know, to, uh, I was hoping to have a pre- repeat of that. <laughs> but um, we we should reciprocate the favor at some point and and feed you perhaps. No, come to my house again. I can give you pasta, you know. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> biryani and pasta. Italian you know? style. Italian Bengali we'll mix fusion. Mix the biryani yeah. with <laughs> <laughs> pasta. Wow, wow. Great. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we actually asked this uh, last question to all our guests. Um, if Depends if you know the episode is riveting and we sometimes forget. But this is <laughs> this the is the hardest. You know how you, we asked you some some pretty tough ones today. We asked you what is the here in twenty mm. seconds or less. <laughs> you've got a, you've got <laughs> no. a harder one now. I guarantee you, this is probably the hardest question. We so will ask get, you for so the get ready. So please make sure the synapses are, are firing up there. <laughs> so if this is this question, right? It got a lot of traction as well. Um, people message me about it and it. Online, it's that good of a question. So here it goes. <laughs> if you don't no say pressure. so yourself, bro. you've just terrified the. <laughs> bege- bege- uh, you should out be scared. Yeah, you like should be. Fear, fear is a muscle. Fear is a muscle. Okay. <laughs> so if you had to chill with three people, um, in a cave, it could be in from um present or the past in history. Excluding Sahab and Rasul oh, and all the prophets, see, because no, no. because on, man. because <laughs> <laughs> everyone will pick them. For me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone will pick them, but for Adab's sake, we'll say they're already in the cave because you know they're blessed men. So we say you have to pick three other people. It could be Muslim, non-Muslim, but it would just be someone that you'd like to have a conversation with in a cave. Who would they be? Three people from all of history. That's really a strange question. Strange. <laughs> I knew you'd be the perfect guy yeah, to would. ask this question. Literally, I. <laughs> Looking at history, so no prophets, no, yeah. none uh, of the Sahaba, yeah, no, 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 the Sahab. Okay, it could be scholars though, but you'd have to kind of explain like why specifically. I don't know. Oh, I'm, um, <laughs> Sulaiman al Qanuni comes to mind. Sultan Sulaiman. Um, he was the most educated man of of his time. He's definitely one. I, I feel strongly towards him. Um, who else? <laughs> I told you. We told um, you. Didn't we? It's it's really difficult because you you, you know th- these sort of opportunities don't come to mind. Oh, the only person came to mind immediately is Sayyidina Rasul alayhi salam, and uh, there's no question about that. Um, the others, um, uh, the, uh, no Sahaba, so uh, probably from... The Sahaba, the sahaba are already there? Imam, we'll just say that. Imam, Imam Rifai would be another one. Imam Rifai, the great, the great Imam yes. of Tasawwuf. Um, and you said three, yeah? You yes, need so one, one more. more. I think Sultan Suleiman and Imam Rifai, you would have a great conversation. Too. You would, um, but the third one, I, I'm, I'm struggling because there's so many... Great scholars. Um, Taibuga would be the third because he's the master of archery. Taibuga. <laughs> Could you give a bit of a brief bio who he is? He's, um, Taibuga was a Greek. Um, okay. So the writer of Serekan archery was a, a slave boy from Greece. He became the Amin Silah in the Mamluk army. He was a renowned scholar and he was the writer of the oldest uh, archery manual in the world. Currently we have in position in the 1300s. So I said I'll throw him in there because of my archery passion. But if you if you say a question like that, like always the longing to the, pro- the prophet. You know I mean? Yeah. So. Prophet and the sahaba and all, you know. But when you say bar those, there's, there's many people on level. There's for sure. For sure. Mashallah. Those were beautiful responses. You know the best answer though we ever got? The best answer when we asked someone? Who? Well, someone I'm said my wife. Your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Very good. everyone else who asked who who got, um, answered the question before felt like shame. Like, oh, <laughs> my wife and my kids. <laughs> 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 They're not in the cave. No, but, obviously, but this is just this is chill. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah to, to relax. I mean, what did Abdullah, uh, uh, sorry, Asadullah Ali al Andalusi said? He said, I'm with my wife every day. You know? yeah, yeah, The cave <laughs> I need, you know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Mashallah. But, um, Mashallah. 
think that was a fantastic conversation. We touched on a lot of stuff and a lot of people, inshallah, can benefit from it. So, Jazakallah Khair Ahmed for coming on Boys in the Cave. We love having you on and it was a fascinating conversation and we really wanted someone like yourself to get as much global exposure as possible because we know you're running with uh you're running Maidan Archery Club. And, and everyone please go check out Maidan Archery Club. If you come to Sydney or you're in Sydney, um I highly suggest I'm sure you guys we could like I don't know off the top of my head where you are, but you can Google search and Yeah, yeah. We're sure we're in find. Leppington, um or or Brinjelli. So um you anybody's welcome. So we run free classes uh, on a monthly um come and try sort of basis. Anyone who is interested in in archery in a, in, as a martial art or as, as an art in general is welcome to come and, and share the experience. And I'll definitely put all the links to Made an Archery Club in our show notes as well for people Thank to check you. it out. Because when I went first time, I was just blown away. But I didn't expect it because like, I've done, I, I said this in the last podcast with you, um, but... When I first did archery, it was in some random school camp and they're just like, oh yeah, pull and shoot and that's it. Hey, everyone's having a good time. But then when I came to you, it was like a spiritual experience, like a different dimension. I'm like, what is this? Is What did I do before? That's not even archery. That's just like, I don't know what that was. <laughs> this one was just, you're, just, you're like um, saying that the shahud with the finger is like how you're meant to hold the bow. And then I was just blown away. It was, you know, it was relating to Salah, um, spirituality. It was just, I was like, you're learning the deen through just doing archery. And as uh, Raphael mentioned, like, you know, empty, or you mentioned yourself on the podcast, like emptying your mind and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. So I think I think it's a very good thing for the community if if kids want to come anyone over 7 is welcome um if they're under 7 then the parents have to be there at all times but over 7 we run classes for as young as 8 year olds and if people go go with like a group of friends as well just to support the club as well inshallah so we'll pull the links so jazakallah here again and we're wishing that you come back on and we'll have another riveting conversation inshallah so barakallahu feekum habbakumullah for our listeners, thank you for giving us your attention. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at info at boysinthecave.com or find us on Facebook. And you can follow our journey through Instagram. And please leave a five-star rating on iTunes as that greatly helps us. Please make sure you subscribe to us as well. Share with your friends and family. Um, it's literally me, Raphael. It's our oxygen. If you give, uh, when you share it with your own social media, with your own community, with your own friends and family, you're literally giving me and Rafa more oxygen, inshallah. So that I hope that gives more value to do it. So and inshallah, you get benefits from sharing it because I'm sure with the guests that we've had, there's a lot of things that people can benefit from in terms of content. So may Allah, you know, reward you for helping us out and we want to grow to new heights. So please hop on Patreon, even if it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars per month. Just support us because even, you know, it's Sadaq Jaria as well. So inshallah, you get the rewards for that. And so that's patreon.com slash boys in the cave. So for my special guest, Ahmed, Raphael, and myself, we wish you all the best. This is Tanjim signing off. Assalamu alaikum.